Okay, so we're recording. I am having done this before, also going to record on my phone, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's get started. I think we're all set. So, um, this is the second of the round tables. Uh, this is the compost round table. Um, saying this for the purposes of the recording mostly. Um, but perhaps if I can just ask you to introduce yourselves very quickly, just your name at this point, and then I'll say a bit more about who you are. Um, Hannah Ruby. Uh, Wolfgang Buttress. Amanda Briggs Good. And this is Sam Thorne uh, chairing this, this session. So, so this session, the, the, kind of, the key word for today's roundtable is is compost, um, which I think connected to some of the other keywords in these other roundtables for me is a little more oblique, um, but maybe also a little more, um, I mean, fertile in a certain kind of way. I, I think there are kind of different ways that we might go at this or, or take it apart. Um, and a kind of way that I wanted to kind of think about this was maybe to jump back to where does this word come from? How has it been used? What has it kind of meant? Because I think that might suggest some things that we're going to be questioning, circling around and so on. But before we get to that, um, I just wanted to quickly introduce each of you um, so we know, we know who we've got around the table. Uh, so Hannah Obi uh, trained at the Wallace Collection with an MA in Museum Studies from UCL. Um, Hannah worked as a curator and acting head of collections at Chatsworth in Derbyshire until her recent move to Harewood near Leeds to take up a new role, head of collections and exhibitions. That was a few months ago. Three months. Three, yeah, three months. Um, Hannah's a decorative art, art specialist, coordinated a major redisplay of the State Department of Chatsworth, undertaking research into the Devonshire archive to underpin the project. And I think the kind of status of archive is going to be something we're, we're talking about today. Um, Hannah went on to lead the exhibition programme at Chatsworth um, and is particularly interested in the continuum of contemporary collecting and commissioning at country houses and the importance of primary sources in communicating human narratives with audiences. And yeah, kind of human and non-human is something I might be asking about at some point. Uh, Dr Amanda Briggs-Good is the head of department for fashion, textiles, knitwear at Nottingham Trent University. As a researcher in the field of textiles, Amanda has worked with the Lace Archive at Nottingham Trent since 2007 and has established it as a significant lace repository, partly through co-organising a season of events in Nottingham called Lace Here Now, which was 2012-13, mm -hmm. and later through co-editing a book of the same name with Black Dog Publishing. Um, Amanda has published, exhibited and presented widely on lace and printed textile design. Um, and her earlier career was a commercial designer for interior fabric and wallpaper. Uh, Wolfgang Buttress creates multi-sensory artworks that draw inspiration from our evolving relationship with the natural world. He explores and interprets scientific discoveries, collaborating with architects, landscape architects, scientists and musicians to create human-centered experiences. Wolfgang has produced artworks on four continents. He's well known for the UK Pavilion, which was first presented at the Milan Expo in 2015, and the Hive, um, which is currently at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew in London, which was a collaboration with uh, the physicist Dr. Martin Benzik, uh, BDP, oh, I don't know, who are BDP? I don't know. Architects. Architects. Exactly. Hawley and Simmons Studio. Um, that project, uh, the Hive, has won over 25 awards, including the gold medal for Best in Show, um, Wolfgang's current projects include sculptures in Taiwan, US, Australia, and the United Kingdom, and he's just fresh back from Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, to kind of get things started, I wanted to just offer a kind of preliminary dictionary definition of compost, because it has some intriguing roots, I think. So the kind of the, the standard definition of compost is a kind of a mixture of decayed organic matter which is used for fertilising soil. So dead leaves, manure, kind of mulch. So, you know, the kind of key ideas here for me are kind of mixture, compound, kind of composite. I suppose the kind of idea of once live forms may be generating new life. So I think this kind of back and forth between the animate and the inanimate is kind of there for me. 
but it really kind of it's it's really about it's about stuff it's about matter it's about material it's things that all of you I think from very different angles uh, concern yourselves with on a kind of daily basis you're all in, involved with kind of preserving things bringing things together people together making new things but the word itself uh, first came into the English language at the end of the 16th century 1587 to be precise it comes from a an older French word and before that a Latin word compositus so to put together or to compose so I suppose on the one hand there's this maybe this sense of this is some of the traditional stuff of of creative practice of composition of you know, arranging things but on the other this kind of sense of nature meeting meeting kind of culture um, this kind of might take us into conversations about the Anthropocene or you know what what is the kind of human or non-human or post-human so it feels like it's particularly fertile in that in that sense um, there are a number of probably subcategories underpinning all of this but before we kind of get to those I'd like to kind of go a bit deeper into this idea of actually what are we understanding by compost here today? Um, so I'd like to ask each of you, by a kind of way of introduction, just to reflect a little bit on when you got this invitation or just thinking out loud here today, this word compost, what does it mean for you? Maybe Hannah, I'll jump sure. to you first. Yeah. I think when I first got the invitation, I think it was the reason I accepted probably was one of trust, really, because I thought, well... If not in contemporary is asking me to do it, it's probably going to be interesting, <laughs> so I'm going to do it. And then I think it was just particularly that word, I thought that is really, it just, it, me, it was one of those words where your brain just starts triggering off different things. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was very much, I responded sort of professionally in terms of my interest in archives and my experience with archives and collections. And actually thinking, you know, archives are compost, it's about layers that evolve, that added to over generations. And then it's about then how they influence and fuel creativity in the future, but also the sense that they're remnants of something that's been lost, something that's been enjoyed, something that's been experienced as well. Mm -hmm. So, for example, your sort of eggshells and your, your peelings and your compost, we've consumed that and that's what's left over. And what comes down to us in archives is the remnants of, a, of, of, of an experience and it's only a partial um, record of that as well so mm -hmm. it's incomplete mm -hmm. it's almost a memory a bit like some of Lara's works it's a, it's a memory of something that's all, that's happened mm -hmm. and and I find it very interesting thinking about what has survived why it survived the stories that we get that that we um, as curators and archivists and artists and researchers maybe sort of bring back to the surface I started thinking of curators as worms, which was a very odd image, um, you know, sort of aerating <laughs> <laughs> compost piles and bringing this matter to the surface to share with people, to then sort of create new narratives with the people that it, that it shared with. Um, and just, I just think, yes, yeah, as I say, I just started thinking of all sorts of random ideas, and so mm -hmm. I just sort of very quickly said I'd love to do it, and the date wouldn't, didn't work out, so when it was rearranged, I just thought, yeah. Here we are. Here we are. Curators as worms. Yes, yeah, curators as worms. There you go. Uh, something to come back to. Um, Amanda, how about you? I mean, you're somebody who's also kind of mm. deep in archives. Mm. Um, I wonder what kind of connections this, this idea of compost has been creating for you. Well, I think Hannah said a lot of it very beautifully, actually. But, I mean, you know, initially I thought about the same things that... Um, you know, the very physical activity, the smell, the mm. word compost mm. sort of, you know, conjures a smell when I'm, you know, when I'm just thinking about um, the waste of everyday life and mm. taking that out to the space. And I have similar memories of taking out compost boxes and then being rotting food and smelling. And I sort of did quickly make that kind of link with the archive and I think particularly layers Mm -hmm. So I think that became quite an interesting idea, you know, we, and in, in terms of the archive that I work with, the layers of information that have come in, the different types of objects that have come in, the different periods of time, I mm. can kind of make analogies to that layering in all sorts of mm. different ways, really, different kinds of materials. Um, 
I think there's something about the archive that we have that I think coming from the museum collection, you know, you might not think of it the same way. But our archive was very unloved and uncared for for quite a lot of time. So that, that idea of rotting mm. and deterioration, you know, was part of my thinking in terms of thinking about that particular mm. space. You know, we have leather that's on a daily basis on mm. the bindings of books kind of falling off because it's not being looked after in the same way over 150 years that mm. a museum collection might be. That's um, interesting, so I guess we tend to think of museum collections as being static somehow, of being preserved, mm. whereas, as you say, archives, mm. it can be a much more flexible term, that it can mm. be stuff under someone's bed, it can be unloved mm. in a corner of a university, mm. and there's a life or a kind of a death to, mm. to that experience mm. too. Mm. But also, I think, interestingly as well, is the fact that, like, actual compost it's all organic matter and it is all deteriorating mm -hmm. and actually as you know even when you are able to sort of look after it or you know there's been a history of that as well you know that all you're doing is staving off the inevitable there is a slight there's not a futility to it but there is you know you know that at some point it does want to get back to its original state and the mm -hmm. documents will fade the documents the paper the vellum as you say, the leather, it does want to mm. and degenerate, doesn't and it? And you're just staving that off, yeah, really. And they're degenerating at different rates, aren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the different materials you know, change yeah. over time in a different, in mm -hmm. a different rate. So I find, I find that quite an interesting kind of analogy um, related to it as well. And I think similarly to you talking about your curators, I'm thinking about students, mm -hmm. the artists that you know have come into the archive to look at it, of being the people who are bringing things to the surface, mm -hmm. who are doing that rotation, because people come in and they get excited and interested in different different bits of it. Mm -hmm. Because they, your they your archive around. is, I suppose, unusual in the sense that it's the archive of an art and design school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. now 175 years. Is, yeah. is the birthday this year. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's of a kind of very discrete amount of time, but it's it's almost by definition of early work, mm. right, of mm. test pieces and mm. so on. Mm. Mm. And it's a you know it's a collection of information that we don't know where it came from. That's again where it would differ from mm. the sort of things that Hannah works with. We don't know where it came from. We mm -hmm. don't know when it came into the archive. We can we can kind of deduce some things. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a lot of detective work, but it's not. Um, it's not being documented in the way that a museum collection mm -hmm. would be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, that there is a real that brings a real richness with it, its mm. own kind of richness and its own uniqueness. Because actually, I think a lot of it is the waste product of the lace industry, and that was another way that I kind mm. of connected to this word compost, really, because you know what a lot of our deduction tells us is that. There will be points, I mean, we know that there's some very specific parts of the collection where there's been a very careful consideration made about this is for the art school and this is very specifically to help the students learn. But I think actually quite a lot of it was probably the waste products of people clearing out their studios mm -hmm. and saying, do you think the art school will find that? In exactly the same way that that still happens today mm -hmm. um, with our relationship with the industry. So I think, you know, there is a kind of a sense of people clearing out um, Absolutely, and, and yeah. Composting their stuff and yeah, yeah. Somewhere yeah. This is recycling. can be less about acquisition, but more about this kind of yeah, mm. forms of donation or gifting. Mm. Something before I turn to you, Wolf. Um, something that both both Hannah and Amanda, what you were talking about, reminded me of was that before I moved to Nottingham, I was living in Cornwall and uh, in in St Ives and working at Tate St Ives, and Tate St Ives runs the Barbara Hepworth. Stu museum and studio, which it has the Tate has done since the late seventies, um, and I'm currently supervising a PhD student who's working on the status of that archive there, which is a particularly morphing archive, and it's a really fascinating history because Hepworth, as you might know, died in a fire in 1975. She was relatively late in life. She was drinking a lot at the time. She was smoking in bed, so on. Very soon after, like less than a year, the house in which you know she she died in a fire was open to the public. Um, all all kind of uh, mention of this fire was was kind of cleaned away, 
And the studio itself was preserved as though she had just walked out to kind of get a cup of tea, something like that. Mm. But all of this was complicated by the fact that Hepworth's son-in-law, who happened to also be the major scholar on her work, also happened to be the director of Tate at the time. So he acquired this for the nation and then set about choreographing this archive, this kind of studio as archive or the other way around, as the way that he understood the work to, to be best read. And that's still the way, 40 plus years on, that when you go to visit the Hepworth <coughs> Studio Museum, you're kind of seeing things. And yet, these kinds of layers that you're talking about are there, because in the salty sea air of Cornwall, all of these tools are heavily patinated, they're kind of rusting, there's piles of dust, the calendar from 1975 is curled and kind of browned and so on. But one of the um, covenants of the family's will is that the garden must remain as though it was 1975. So you have this kind of perverse situation where a garden isn't left to grow, it's left as though it was in photos in 75. And yet the studio seems to be growing because it's growing these kinds of new layers. And when I was there, there was this conversation, well, shouldn't we just conserve these things, these are parts of the Tate collection, shouldn't they be kind of kept as they were when they were, you know, acquired? Shouldn't we clean off this rust? And realised that actually, no, this is how most people who visited know this studio. And what they like is that kind of sense of kind of ageing and so on. And so some of what my PhD students are looking at is what kinds of challenge does this uh, give to the museum when it's thinking about itself as a repository of something that's kind of static? Um, what kinds of, how do you actually archive? What kind of value do you give to some of these waste products, actually? Because plenty in the studio is these kinds of waste products. But these things that Hepworth probably never really wanted to be exhibited to the public. Mm. And it kind of gets at a number of different tensions or frictions that I think are there mm. for institutions that claim to be preserving things in a certain kind of state. But there's a kind of politics to that mm. about especially when, you know, this is the National Museum and this is the kind of, the son-in-law of this artist who's... It, well, it's sort of like the professional and the personal yeah. overlaps, mm. isn't it? And it's something mm -hmm. that I experience very much sort of working for at houses where yeah. families still live there as well. Mm -hmm. And and it is, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a construct. So all of his emotion mm. at the time of his, you know, of his mother-in-law passing is all tied into that and what he wanted to present but also as you say that fact that it is static I think that's also another reason why I sort of probably work in historic houses is the fact that I like the fact that it continues to evolve it is mm -hmm. this sort of continuum mm -hmm. and that is the essence of creativity mm -hmm. yet her, because she's no longer here that has come to a fixed point in time mm -hmm. and it's sort of you know it's very similar to the National mm -hmm. Trust what is its what does it do now? Mm -hmm. what, what purpose does it serve? Mm -hmm. How is it being presented? What sort of layers are people putting onto that as mm -hmm. well? Mm -hmm. And and how you know, how do you retain authenticity mm -hmm. to it as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what does authenticity mean in yeah, this context? Exactly. And I mean, there is is there any in a sense? Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's interesting what you said about lace, though, because you know I know a bit about it just because. Joy obviously worked, worked there for a while. Mm. <coughs> but you kind of get the idea of kind of lace, and it's you know it's a collection of holes, it's a collection of voids, mm. and it's a collection mm. of nothing in a way. And mm. you know, and, and the the cotton itself, it's organic, you know, and mm. and left to its own devices, it'll just go back to the earth, it'll rot. So its kind of natural mm. state is almost to go back to nothing. It's a celebration of nothing. So it's a, so in a way, kind of watching it kind of mm. dissolve is is mm. see it in a way it's mm -hmm. like trying to preserve it in, mm. in aspects. Mm -hmm. but but, uh, and Wolf, how about you? Because for um, for you, you know, when I think about your work, I think about how you're often kind of brokering conversations between the natural world and humans, you know, whether it's working with bees and musicians or whether it's working with the sun <laughs> and, yeah. and physicists. Uh, it feels like you're always in a kind of conversation with, you know, it's an ecological conversation often, it, it seems to me. And I wonder kind of, how for you this this idea this kind of word of compost kind of struck you? Well, I think it's it's I suppose it's that it's that 
it's a combination of the two words really. it's like compost and animism I mm. think it's, it's, it's those two things which, which are quite interesting mm -hmm. like one is kind of uh, I don't know, like I suppose like a in animism, you, you know, there's, I suppose, belief there's a spirit in everything, every little thing, whether it's in like a glass of water or an insect or a human or a, a mountain and sort of stuff. So, I suppose this idea: are all these things? Do they have their own individual spirits, or is it one spirit? And when everything kind of gets rotten down, it goes back to nothing, mm -hmm. and then so we're all the same. You know, we're all mm -hmm. stardust. Mm -hmm. so I suppose it's 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 that. I suppose when does when does the individual, when does the individual organism or thing, uh, yeah, w when it's an individual and when is it then part of anything? Because suppose when everything kind of ends up rotting down, it, it goes back back to the earth. But it was interesting what you said before, I think, uh, Samuel, about this uh, uh, Anthropocene. Mm. And it's, uh, I mean, usually it's, you know, it takes you know, millions of years to kind of make a, a mark actually on the, on the strata in the what's going to happen mm -hmm. they reckon already what well, the impact that we've done on the earth we the, you know there's going to be a, the plastics we're putting into the mm -hmm. world the, you know, the chemicals we made such a mark in such in, in a, such a tiny tiny sort of space of time and maybe kind of historically you, you, you have this sort of sense that everything kind of goes back to the earth everything's kind of natural has a mm -hmm. cycle and somehow we're at more in tune, at one with it, you know, with, mm -hmm. with the world as a, as a superorganism, mm -hmm. I suppose. But it, it seems to me that we're, as humans, kind of more and more out of whack, mm -hmm. you know, and and changing. And in the end, you know, the world will carry on, the earth will carry on, and you know, with, we will probably die at one point, you know, mm -hmm. if, whether that's a hundred years, a thousand years, ten thousand mm -hmm. years, or a million years. Mm -hmm. but, but the world is as a thing will, will kind of carry on, and I think sometimes because we're conscious of it, we have this sometimes this arrogance that. Everything is evolved around us. We're just a thing living mm -hmm. part of part of this planet. And that's, I think, the main yeah. What this kind of this notion of the Anthropocene, what yeah. it presents to us, is actually a total collapse of yeah. we're separate from yeah. culture. It's like mm -hmm. or from nature that we're actually the two have been completely enmeshed. I read this book recently called I think The Shock of the Anthropocene. And in part, it was about the arguments about how to date where this new geological epoch might have started. You know, some would argue it was the Industrial Revolution. Others argue that it was the precise moment that the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima. Um, but others would say that it kind of goes back much further than that to um, the first Europeans to get to the Americas, mm -hmm. for example, was the kind of first time when you can actually see major deforestation yeah. happening. But what's clear now is that, yeah, aside from any kinds of traces and strata, one thing that um, I was reading that you can really, that, that future generations will be able to tell that we have been here, is um, the networks of subway systems around the world. If, if, we, if our only trace was this one thing, going back to that <laughs> idea of holes and layers, yeah. it would be like actually worms. these worm, worm holes. No, it all yeah, to worms. Yeah, worm holes <laughs> that have left around, like now they're sufficiently deep and um, and there are enough of them to kind of tell that we we have been here. And, Cause yeah, because mm -hmm. I think it's in I think it's in Scandinavia, I think. And uh, the builder, because it, again, it's it's, it's, it's aside, I'm sure it's in, it's in Norway, Sweden. You you probably know. And uh, it's, it's it's this idea that that potentially in time that we won't know the clues and and the language and the sort of stories because everything kind of degrades. And I used to sort of think that even like a you know, like a, a PDF or a JPEG, that these sort of things will just last. But they don't. Even these kind of mm -hmm. these technological things, they, they all erode. They all kind of sort of fade. And uh, so th this, this idea in five hundred thousand, ten thousand years sort of time, will people be able to understand our language, how we actually mm -hmm. talk to each other? Mm -hmm. Because we're leaving less physical things like writing, mm -hmm. like, exactly. like, uh, and which you can decipher, you can work out what happens. But it, as things kind of go more digital, mm -hmm. and things become less kind of written down. Mm. In terms of what we're leaving as a legacy, we think we've got all this incredible mm. stuff around. But then does that dissolve even more <laughs> than something yeah. with these kind of I know, Egyptian tablets or something which one, is kind of carved? One, one member of the secret committee uh, once curated an exhibition about 10 years ago called the Museum of Martian Art. And the kind of the conceit of the exhibition was that people come from Mars, they'd been completely baffled by art history, and they created their own museum on Mars using the artworks as kinds of artifacts. But rather than showing it in the kind of conventional, you know, like cubism to this, to this, to this, they did things by type, of course. 
Mm. So you've got a kind of minimalist monolith next to a fridge, next right. to a Warhol kind of Brillo box, because they're all the things that look the same, yeah. or something yeah. like that. I have this kind of idea of, yeah. Um, yeah. that some of this kind of puts forward that you have these alternative categories or taxonomies mm -hmm. will inevitably emerge because of what hasn't been preserved. Yeah. But I, and I think that I think that I, that's the the challenge I think of digitization and and I think it was only the fact that also we don't write the letters so we've got emails mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how is any of that going to survive as technology moves on at such an increasing yeah. pace exactly what you've just said Wolfgang it's it's what what are actually we're going to leave behind because mm -hmm. you know whereas something on vellum mm. actually although I always think of it's a it's a it's a fight to keep it to keep it yeah. going it actually does have a longer lifespan fun, yeah. or mm -hmm. an Egyptian yeah. steely or something yeah. mm. does have more of a longer lifespan actually than what we're doing now and it was interesting on that um, State Department uh, project that I worked on it was the first thing that the Duke and Duchess did when they moved in and mm. it was in 2005 and I think it was at that point it very much got the Duke thinking, well, how are we saving, even saving emails? You know, what is our archive for the future? Mm. And he was very specific, and that immediately got him into thinking, right, you know, you need to keep the emails and everything around this digitally and archive that. And that sort of set off a, a policy in terms of, you know, saving. Huh. Whereas once upon a time it would be, it would be sort of a printed invoice. Yeah. Mm. But then, you know, and then that's how you would find, how we, you know, how you'd find out who did something yeah. in mm -hmm. 200 years' yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And it's a major, it is a major issue, it the is fact it? that it's so ephemeral, like conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but then I was sort of thinking, am I overthinking that? Because at the end of the day, all that we've lost within an archive, we've lost everybody's voices, all the conversations that people had, mm -hmm. haven't sort of necessarily survived. Mm -hmm. And I thought, maybe I'm just, you know, I'm just sort of imagining the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but actually, you know, how many organisations do have policies? Um, I have to say it was with varying degrees of success as yeah, well. Sure. Of actually thinking, how are we recording um, in the way that the ledger books and, the, and things like that, that that I have used for research yeah. from the sort of 1700s and before, um, an help me. And, and, and it's just a, a similar sort of thing, because this, this, this idea of, sort of technology is kind of so clean and preserving and... But meant so, so much, sort of, even sort of take like an example of making things, I suppose. Like, I don't know, even like historically, you kind of get the Industrial Revolution, and even like, even, I don't know, it's like a, a, fab a metal fabricator, say, for example. And so much of that was kind of passed down orally. Mm -hmm. and, and, there's, and then these skills, as the industry dies, these skills kind of get lost. And then, so then what, what's this kind of happening maybe the last sort of 20, 25, 20, 30 years is that things kind of get designed maybe more with computers and CAD sort of things, but then those programs sort of change and you can't read all the programs. And so, huh. so, so all these things that you sort of think are mm. so uh, technologically ad advanced, it's so many times now you have to go back to the drawings to kind of work mm. out because it's very difficult mm. and computers don't talk to each other. They kind of get, uh, they have uh, new sort of settings and new sort of programs. Mm. So, old, mm. so some of my old programs don't talk to any of the old ones, and this is only within five mm. or ten years. Mm. Yeah. So all these things you think have been so mm. technologically advanced, they have this kind of inbuilt kind of obsolescence. And yeah. So that idea so of craft being was. a kind of continuum, yeah. right, of like, yeah, being handed down or taught shifts mm. because it's yeah new program yeah. several times a generation. And, and, and I think we sort of think we're handing this information down through technology, but sometimes a better way to do that is to have something physical, mm. or or to tell it orally, or, or to document it. And I mean, even what's what we're recording on this. I mean, maybe in 50, 100, 200 years time, you won't be able to work out well that that tape, whatever it is, will mm. probably <laughs> won't even exist anymore. So, mm -hmm. so how do you kind of keep doing this? Mm -hmm. so, yes. so, it's, so it's this yeah. idea of kind of preserving, but then everything just goes to dust again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Hannah, what you know, in your experience of having worked in these homes which as you said are kind of still like living entities yeah how aware of you are you of of what's been lost i think i think a lot and i think it's it's a it's a trap that you sort of figure out hopefully pretty early on mm. is the fact that you know you're only getting a fragment and i think it's particularly something of the size of collection that i worked with for 14 years as well is the fact that you could think that you found evidence in the archive for a particular piece of furniture or a particular painting or something and you think oh yes yeah no I recognize that and that's still in the collection now and that's interesting that's mm -hmm. where it was in 1770 or something like mm -hmm. that but then actually you think but how many other 
of those did they have that haven't come down to us, that haven't survived? So mm -hmm. for me, being particularly interested in ceramics, um, I went through a process of going through a 1770 inventory of a china closet at the Countess of Burlington at Chiswick. And, and I managed to actually identify some really specific things that were still mm -hmm. in the Devonshire collection today. But then other things, you think, well, that matches, but I don't know that that's the same thing, because mm -hmm. actually there were probably 10 more of those that got broken and were mm -hmm. thrown away. And you have to be very careful to think, even though when you think you found a, a, you know, a real connection, it might actually, for all you know, relate to something else that mm -hmm. just hasn't survived. And so you learn to be very... Um, very very aware of that mm -hmm. and not sort of jumping too far on and and it was interesting actually because i was there when um i started working for the generation beforehand and then when the 11th duke died and we did the um obviously had to value and list everything after that which was a, a long process obviously in a collection <laughs> that and house that size and it made me realize as we were going around trying to capture everything and it made me realize that these inventories of 1770 and beforehand that I was looking at were literally a snapshot of that moment of that day because mm -hmm. I knew for, I learned from my experience that somebody would come in mm. value that room or look at everything in that room but I knew that the next day a painting had already moved somewhere else sure and yeah. so things are getting lost even though you think you've got this very definite record mm -hmm. that it's very black and white mm -hmm. in actual fact it isn't at all mm -hmm. um, and it's it can be you just have to find a point of not being paralysed by that so that you are actually willing to make connections and offer connections up, mm -hmm. but without, but knowing that you can never actually be entirely certain. Do you know how many items are in the collection? Oh, gosh, I don't know, maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe 80,000? Maybe 80,000, right. Plus, I yeah. think, and that, I mean, um, uh, that's a pretty conservative estimate. Yeah. I think the library loan is about 40,000. Okay. And then the archive, I mean, is, 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 would be extra yeah. as, as well, probably. Yeah. As I mean, fast. Am I, yeah. I mean, in my very small uh, experience, the date of the Chatsworth collection is that there's a general sense of what might be there. Mm. But, you know, it's not as though it's a museum collection where there's a kind of, catalog where you can say I'll just go and check so yeah. when we were asking questions of the different curators we mm. we were saying this is for a project that's opening soon with the artist Linda Sterling and Linda would say do you have any tapestries from India and <laughs> they'd say no I don't think so let me check and yeah. then a week later say no no we found something and then the elephant came out didn't and then it? the elephant tapestry still, came out still the yeah. elephant came yeah, out. which I had never seen in 14 yeah. years and I think that's the thing, things are constantly appearing and it's also about that loss of knowledge, isn't it? So, so probably somebody working with the collection 100 years ago, they were called the librarian, but they were responsible for the objects as well and mm. the archives. Um, they probably would have known that, sure. but obviously that, in, that knowledge gets lost and then someone comes in later. And, and it was actually something, the, it was a, when I first joined, it was a keeper there who'd been mm -hmm. there for 30 years. And, um, and he said, you will never know everything and actually, I was coming in with a decorative arts slant, particularly ceramics, and he said, well, that's actually going to be really interesting because nobody has been here with your particular mm -hmm. passion mm -hmm. for a long time. So it was almost like areas, of discrete areas of the collection got their moment in the sun mm -hmm. with different people coming in and different mm -hmm. generations because you can never know it all. And that was really liberating because I'd come from the Wallace Collection, which was, I think, I think sort of about 6,000 objects mm -hmm. and a very small archive where I always felt a real pressure to know the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. And then I suddenly thought, you know what, actually, you can't hear. Mm -hmm. um, and That's it was it. very different. It becomes yeah. more of a space of speculation. I remember yeah. um, after you left talking to Sash Giles yeah. about a book of spells. Oh, that, the yeah. clavicular. That's it, yes. yeah. And I think I was asking her roughly when it was from. And she said, well, I don't know. She said, but yeah. I would imagine. <laughs> you know, yeah. But yeah. It, it must have been pre-scientific enlightenment. It must have been after this. Yeah. So probably it would be in about, I don't know, the 17th, 17th. That's really complicated as well because that particular example, that's actually a copy of an earlier original spell, huh. so the spell book as uh -huh. well. Okay. So, so it's actually a recreation of an earlier original that was think was done for like a, a member of the Italian uh, aristocracy, I think, or something like that. So again, that's got a really yeah. vague, murky, and you know you can drive yourself mad trying to get to the bottom of things. I mean, I spent two years with a textile. Um, uh, historian conservator Annabel Westman trying to figure out which about they were about 
10 crimson damask beds at the time of the state apartment <laughs> and then through the history of Chatsworth we were trying to follow these beds around the around the building you know and we drove mm-hmm. ourselves nearly mad mm-hmm. trying to figure it mm-hmm. out it was crazy because all the rooms changed name the descriptions of the bed changed um, as the textile faded over the years so the yellow became a lot more prominent than the red because it was a, 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 a crimson and gold damask and we were trying to find this trail and I mean I think Annabelle got there in the end but Again, it is a lot of it's it's that speculation. It's an educated mm-hmm. guess. Mm-hmm. A lot of it, and it's mm-hmm. very difficult to be more the further back in time you go to be certain about. Things, and what happens it? then when someone like you leaves after fourteen years, taking mm-hmm. all of that those experiences or those kind of intuitions with you? Yeah, I know. I think that's. I think it's just sort of part of it and then you get the next person with their interests and then they bring their own particular slant to it so I think it's a very positive thing and I felt with leaving as well though it was positive for me it was actually very positive for the organisation because I thought you know what actually I would really like somebody new to come in Mm -hmm. at this point because it's a really exciting time and really take it somewhere else Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah you do lose a lot I mean the keeper that I referred to who left after 30 years I mean, his knowledge, and everybody was saying, you know, we need to download his brain, and mm-hmm. you, you can't, mm-hmm. can you? Not you yet. Can't, no, not, not yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> but, but, but it does sort of feel like, like in some ways, because I think maybe in the West more, we have this idea that somehow by preserving culture, that, then that defines us somehow by kind of mm-hmm. almost putting this in, mm-hmm. you know, and that's our kind of history. But then, say, for example, I don't know, like in Australia, the, the Aboriginal, you know, the, one of the oldest... A continuous culture mm-hmm. in, in, in the world. The kind of traces you know, they leave as a culture, the physical traces are really minimal, and mm-hmm. it's, it's mainly sort of song, like song and narrative and sort of story. And uh, because they're like nomadic, you know, they leave no kind of traces in terms of kind of buildings or churches, like what we do in the West. You know, mm-hmm. this is our sort of stamp. And mm-hmm. and, uh, and then and somehow we we kind of I think uh, as an arrogant thing, especially the last, it's changing now. I think, but I think when the you know, when the white westerners went over to say to, to Australia, dead in arrogance, these these Aboriginals are, you know, they're heathens, they're thick, they know nothing, they've got no history, they're kind of like animals, and and, and what's kind of coming out now is let me say, for example, doing this, this project over there. I mean, the the, astro- uh, the Aboriginals are probably the oldest uh, uh, astronomers in the world. How they mm. kind of mapped the stars oh. and how they mapped the dark spaces between the stars, they give them all names. And the spaces between spaces between the stars because okay. there's so many stars in the desert. It's uh, they map the stars and say like a there was one sort of thing called the giant emu. And at a certain point of the, of the of the year, there's a shape, there's this dark sort of space, and it does look like an emu. And that's the time then when it's safe to go out and collect the emu eggs. So there's a real strong relationship between the stars mm. and them. But, but this is mm-hmm. negative space negative coming back again, I think, space. isn't and it? Yeah. Lace or the stars. And it is, and, and I think what we're, we're doing in, in terms of sort of astrophysics, astrophysics is what they're you know, trying to discover more is, is the space between the stars of a dark matter, say, for example. Mm. So we're just catching up the last 25, 30, 50 years about what's happening. And maybe the Aboriginals have known instinctively, intuitively, spiritually about what's happening between these dark spaces mm-hmm. for 50, 60,000 years. And how are they doing How are they doing that? This was with the naked eye or this the, was the, with... The naked eye and, uh, and then uh, there the, would the maps some of these uh, uh, things in some of their dot paintings uh, but most of, mo- most of them were, were, were fables, were stories, were sort of mm-hmm. songs and, uh, and these were kind of passed down because, the, you know, as a tribe, because it's so massive, Australia, they'd walk, obviously, miles and miles and miles, and they'd use the stars to navigate by. And so, and so, because it's so clear, mm-hmm. usually the sort of stars, it's, it's really important for them mm-hmm. which, which way to go, which not what. So they had a really in, instinctive, scientific approach really to what the stars mm-hmm. were. Because it isn't written down, we mm-hmm. sort of think somehow that it's, it's less progressive yeah. than us. But in a lot of ways, it's probably l- a lot more. Uh, Resolve, mm. Mm. which is, and, and I think that kind of go back to you sort of saying about you know the archive and, and somehow we collect all this sort of stuff and, and then this is who we are this this is yeah. kind of what we were mm-hmm. this is what we want to be and mm-hmm. and I think you know I was thinking about that orchestration and you know you've got somewhere like Chatsworth which is kind of you know the pinnacle of you know one of our stately homes in the UK and, and what that's saying about us as a culture. Mm. And the lace archive does, you know, how you, you can pick up similar s- stories. Um, but I suppose one of the things that 
the layers of our clothes for me are about the people. Mm. And actually that's ironically for somebody who's focused on textiles and fabric through you know my profession and things that I'm really passionate and excited about, I've actually become much more interested in social history and mm. of that industry. Yeah. But also production really. It's the it's mm. the history of production, um, isn't it? And I suppose when we did Lace Here Now, um, we had a storyteller who, th- there's a book written by um, a man who came up from London. So th- there's kind of a really horrible, ugly underbelly of the lace industry. I suppose this is what I'm trying to say a bit more clearly. There's a horrible underbelly of the lace industry, as there probably is with any industry mm. that design led one or um, th- that we might want to think about. Um, So we know that there was young boys and girls coming up from London from workhouses being picked up on the streets and coming in and working in mills in Nottingham. And we know that because nothing was known about some of those children, if they died unexpectedly or or industrial accident or whatever, they weren't buried in the churches because they were of no, no religion, there was no families. So there are hedgerows around Nottinghamshire where there's kids buried under hedges and this man who was one of those children um, writes writes about this as an adult. He, mm. he eventually became a mill owner and, and it's that kind of underbelly. So I kind of often get frustrated, I suppose, that, um, that we can't share those stories in mm-hmm. a more mm. overt way mm. when mm. we're coming into places like Chatsworth or into yeah. my archive where people are just mesmerised by beauty and aesthetic mm. But actually, there, there are all these stories to tell. And I was really reminded of this this week with somebody shared um, a film called Machines. Um, it's, it's on the BBC and um, it's, in a, it's kind of essentially in an Indian mill, a textile mill. And there's no dialogue. There's no narration. There is just a peer, a peer, I've watched about 15 minutes of it so far. It's about an hour and a half. Um, and it appears to be just someone walking around this mill with a camera mm. and just... There's, you know, there's kids in there mm. falling asleep, mm-hmm. you know, mm. pulling things through, you know, horrible machines. There's mm. this fire. There's all kind of all sorts of risks of where there's no health and safety consideration. And it was just filmed undercover yeah. in this. No, I don't or, think it's undercover okay. because there's a bit where somebody's saying to these kids, "Stand up, stand up, they're coming," and it, there's kind of just a little bit of. Um, uh, in, interpreted mm-hmm. sort of, they're obviously speaking in English so there's a sort of, um, you know this is the text put up on the film but, but 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 no real dialogue and nobody explaining we're now going into this room or that room mm-hmm. so it, it's kind of there is a power because it has that sort of feeling but I don't I don't think it is undercover mm-hmm. um, so I was kind of reminded that quite overtly sort of by starting to watch that this week but also I don't know whether the, anyone came to Chatsworth from a project that was called Slave Trade Legacies? I don't think so. Um, probably oh. probably Harwood, because obviously part of that's got a slavery archive, because Harwood, where I now am, obviously was built on the money from sugar plantations. So mm-hmm. that's a massive part of it. Well, most history. of them like Newstead Abbey, that's it was all based on slaves. That's, that's yeah. where the money came so, from. Wasn't no, it? So it was a really ugly history. Really, it's so beautiful. Really. It kind of comes from something quite horrific. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that is, you know, and that is really hard to get your yeah. head around mm-hmm. I think today yeah. I think Chatsworth no they, they I think that money originated in the uh, the breakup of the monastery so, was <laughs> <laughs> so not entirely without its own well, little free song but it's not yeah, quite, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah and it, but not not the slave so not slavery this project is one that's been going on at Nottingham mm. University and it has been um, specifically focused around getting a community of Afro-Caribbean people who have lived mm-hmm. most of their life probably now in Nottingham um, and um, really sort of corralling them and getting them to think as a community about challenging mm-hmm. those kind of hierarchies of, uh, of stately homes, of museums, of galleries mm-hmm. to say, where has your money come from? Or actually, where has some of this art come from? Mm-hmm. Who's made it? And actually, why aren't you telling us about that? Why aren't you revealing that bit mm. of the story? And um, you know, I think, I think, I think the word compost and this conversation for me, there's kind of this really, sh- it is those layers, isn't mm-hmm. it? Those layers of information where you can have that, um, you know, kind of 
expert eye telling you about a piece of ceramic or a piece mm. of lace but actually there's so many layers underneath that that mm. tell so many different stories mm. and people really connect to those social history stories don't they as well yeah. and you know when you're talking about how things were made where things were made how many people worked in the lace industry you know people kind of really fascinated and it hooks um, I think it's interesting there's been a major shift within country houses probably in the last sort of 18 months particularly I've sort of felt a couple of years that it is very much more about it's not about the object you wouldn't necessarily say well this is a set of vase with the name of the model with the date what it was made of that very traditional mm -hmm. sort of approach um, and that is sort of what currently exists in uh, most places but there is very much a lot of sort of research and talk about about the human stories and I can remember a few years ago going to the V&A and seeing that um, tomorrow exhibition um, you know where they where um, where that at the, in the the apartment of a fictional character mm -hmm. was was reproduced and that I came away from that with such that had a really big impact on me and I came back and I looked at the state rooms which obviously I'd done years earlier and I and I just said to everybody I said we talk about the objects I said but what do you actually learn about the man that conceived them, why he wanted it, sort of what the people that were involved in it. I mean, we talked about maybe one or two in relation to some carving. And I was like, what do you learn about the person when you come round Chatsworth? And actually, it was sort of quite difficult because in mm -hmm. those formal spaces, it's not really about an individual. It's about theatricality. It's a theatre set. Mm -hmm. But throughout the house, and you know, I've sort of, I've been thinking for, for years about how, how do you do that? How do you bring the people out and the stories out that are actually far exactly what you've been saying and and actually and as I say in the last sort of probably couple of years particularly there's a m big shift in terms of changing interpretation um, and it's about it's about different voices and actually it's sort of creating something together rather that idea mm -hmm. I think that idea of the curator deciding what is relevant mm -hmm. is so far mm -hmm. gone the pendulum is definitely swinging the other way yeah, very because, much because, because more than beauty doesn't it because that's yeah. I, mean, I think sometimes you go into these places and you, you might walk in the first room and they're usually pretty overpowering because there's so much stuff and it's all incredibly made beautifully cut and you get the second one but it's almost it's so overwhelming mm -hmm. after the second third fourth room you, you kind of end up walking fast yeah. and you can't take anything can't. in it mm -hmm. and I think the only way to arrest you and to make it real is it's like what you said saying Amanda, is I think once it becomes real it becomes a story you have an emotional connection with the yeah. thing whatever it is, the object, the, the bit of lace, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the bit of cloth, or wh yeah. whatever, whatever it is, the painting, then as a story, and then you he, then he connect to it, then it has relevance and, and meaning. And mm -hmm. so, so, so sometimes the most smallest, I don't know, kind of less valuable thing can be the most revealing, the most wonderful thing, rather than the most kind of mm -hmm. you know, something which has got loads of gold and jewels. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've, I definitely. mean, you've all talked in different ways about, I suppose, just the kind of the darker side of Western modernity, enlightenment, renaissance, about how these industries are imbricated with colonialism, by imperial mm. plunder, the dark side of these industries, of, and so on. And I think, yeah, this is there's starting to be a shift in this kind of understanding of like, well, the reason these collections happened was because of you know X Y Z. Yeah. But how do you, in your kind of, I mean, what do you do about that? I mean, how do you how do you tell these kinds of unspoken stories? So kind of, I was really struck, Amanda, by this image of kind of like dead children under hedges. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like how that's kind of an indelible image. Yeah. How do you, working with an archive, tell of these yeah. kinds of absences? Um, I think that's really hard. I mean, I think, um, you know, the event that we, we had where we had Lace here now, and we really wanted to make sure that we had some opportunities not just to celebrate the aesthetic and the beauty um, of the pieces and of the making um, so we kind of purposely put some events in there that actually did tackle some mm -hmm. of those other sides we also um, got some film footage by a mace in um, in lincolnshire of of films of, uh, that have been made like little snapshots of newsreel stuff or mm -hmm. what it was like in in a lace factory mm -hmm. because there is so much romanticism mm -hmm. there is so much imagery that romanticizes and 
people still don't make the link with machines mm-hmm. and lace. Mm-hmm. You know, even though you talk about machine-made lace, they still think it's ladies with cushions on them. Just because of the yeah. because of the delicacy of the, the yeah. thing. But it was so yeah. loud those machines. They just must have been unbearable. All the yeah. dust in those mm-hmm. places, yeah. breathing all this crap, and mm-hmm. there's no. Uh, there's no uh, you know, um, uh, what's ventilation, it? ventilation. Yeah. there's nothing yeah, so you're breathing yeah, yeah. all this shit it was really loud yeah. it must have knackered yeah. people's ears up yeah. freezing in the winter really hot in the summer you yeah. Know. Yeah. really yeah. unpleasant place to work. and then at the end of it there's some glorious delicate sort of sumptuous yeah. as you sort of say romantic or whatever yeah. Yeah. beautiful kind of sort of thing but, but that's the thing about lace it, cause it is about death isn't it I mean uh, the, the actual symbolism of lace yeah. it kind of yeah well, it gets used in really significant points of people's life, doesn't Death it? Death and Still. sex and yeah. marriage. Yeah, and marriage and babies yeah. and christenings yeah. and yeah, yeah it's um, yeah. and it's that reveal and conceal exploration as well, isn't it, in mm-hmm. terms of people's identity? But it is really hard to tell that story because mm-hmm. actually, loads of people just don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I haven't made, I haven't tried to publish anything on that. What I have been trying to do is capture stories of people who did work in the archive oh, sorry work in the lace industry mm-hmm. as kind of oral mm-hmm. histories before they die because yeah. essentially they're in their 70s and 80s now mm. and we you know there are there are a, a number of very small manufacturing areas of, of lace still but we're talking less than 100 people mm-hmm. working in the industry that once employed 25,000. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we really want to capture all those people who work for Birkins and some of the lace company, larger lace companies. And actually, we'd like to tell the story of the cleaner and we'd like to tell the story mm-hmm. of the MD and everyone in between. Mm-hmm. One, of, uh, one of my PhD students, um, we've, got, we've got some um, wages books in the archive that were do- donated sort of fairly recently. Um, and she found them really, really fascinating. And she followed this woman called, I can't remember her name, um, Anna Javes, and she followed her all the way through this wages book, which covered about a 10 or 15 year period. She And the reason she got fascinated with her, she was the lowest paid person huh. in the wages book. And so she kind of tried to just track what was happening to her and when she was getting paid. And then there's suddenly this gap and she stops and then she suddenly reappears again. Um, and she managed to do a little bit of digging around census details, and it seems that she was um, she was a widow, and she was the cleaner mm-hmm. in the factory, and she'd clearly been ill at some point, um, and that's where she mm-hmm. kind of you know she disappeared, and then she sort of died in service, and she did a she was an artist, and she did a performance about about this piece, um, and that was that was a really fascinating story to tell, and she you know she managed to communicate that to mm-hmm. quite a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But people are fascinated by people, aren't they? So mm-hmm, yeah. people do yeah. want to listen, but not when they've come to see the archive. Mm-hmm. When they've come to the archive, they just want to be. Mm-hmm. They want that fantastical kind of experience of looking at of looking at really lovely mm-hmm. um, lace. Um, you kind of have to pick your moment, I think, mm-hmm. when you want to raise that sort mm-hmm, of conversation. Mm-hmm. Sure, and it's yeah, yeah. That was just when you were talking about that moment of being in the archive. I mean, just in this last year, having spent a lot of time in very mm-hmm. different archives, mm-hmm. both of the archives that you've worked at and others, is that kind of intoxication of these mm. spaces too, right? <laughs> that very far from being a kind of dry kind of public records and so on, they're like, they're tremendously tactile mm-hmm. and even overwhelming. You know, that when I've mm-hmm. been to, you know, anything from a BNA archive to a kind of film archive that's literally in someone's cupboard in South London, there's this kind of sense of a kind of immersion in a world, however mm-hmm. big or small. And it's kind of, well, yeah, when you were talking about the noise of the factories and so on, it, part of it is that this is a kind of aural thing, yeah. you know, yeah. whether it's the kind of quiet waves of the rustles mm-hmm. of, you know, or, or whatever it might be. Well, the but smells, also, when you mentioned the smell. It's the smell, smell it's right? The smell. When you mentioned yeah. the smell, that yeah. really... And I, I, I was never, funny enough, I was just writing that down because yeah. I thought that really... It, struck it, me. And it takes you somewhere, doesn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah. You know. and I can never get rid of the dust. Yeah, I think yeah. even the the V and A, which I imagine is like a relatively clean yeah. environment, yeah. for like a day later, I'm feeling like I'm continually washing my hands yeah. because mm, there's yeah. like encrusted kind of sense yeah. of things. So you've yeah. got part of the collection on you. Or absolutely, you know, you know. absolutely. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you're transferring your DNA onto That's it yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. You're yeah. kind of breathing it in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting, isn't it? But they're quite rarefied environments, aren't they? And mm-hmm. you feel, you know, I've been lucky enough to go to lots of archives and see things that most people don't get to see as well and it's 
it, you feel incredibly privileged, don't you? You yeah. do feel that you've entered a magical world, mm -hmm. um, and they do have all their own smells and you know their their own particular kind of lighting, and then all of that kind of fetishism about gloves and sometimes mm -hmm. you're not allowed to touch anything anyway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that all becomes kind of very seductive part of mm -hmm. that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm, you're right. It is. It is, and it is very much an experience as well, isn't it? And I think it's about how you, what comes out of it, and how it becomes an experience for more people yeah. mm -hmm. as well. And as you say, I think the way through that is into, is into challenging things and bringing out different voices. So, for example, um, a couple of things we're doing at Harwood this year. One is sort of you know it's a Chippendale tercentenary, and of course it's got the largest Chip Chippendale sort of commission ever so you were doing that but again it was sort of trying to think trying to think of a way of doing it differently because it had been done really well mm -hmm. sort of about 12 years ago or something like that in a very sort of traditional way that was appropriate for was appropriate then but then so now we've sort of got um this wonderful man samuel popplewell who is the steward name, it's a mm -hmm. great name he just w makes me want to go away and write a book mm -hmm. instantly you mm -hmm. know and, um, mm -hmm. and he was just uh, and he was the steward at the time and he's the one that's you know that's actually facilitating all of the work and Chippendale's firm's coming in they're putting up the wallpaper they're not getting paid he's the one that's sort of trying to sort of keep it all going mm -hmm. when the money's you know not flowing and stuff like that and that's really interesting so trying to sort of use his words mm -hmm. but again it's not complete enough to form a narrative for the whole exhibition. But, but then also thinking about, um, you know, looking at the reactions to Chippendale interpre in, you know, interiors at the time. So some absolutely loved it. Some thought it was the most revolting, over-the-top, ornate. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, they were disgusted by it. You know, mm -hmm. you've got everyone from William Wilberforce there through to, you know, sort of... Um, you know, to the local cleric, and they're all their different, their different opinions on it. And so we're putting those up mm -hmm. in the exhibition as well to sort of try and encourage visitors today. Because you're saying, as you were saying just earlier, about the aesthetic of it, we're presenting these things as though you should love them. Yeah. You should walk into a Robert Adam and Chip and Dale interior and love it. Who says? Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't have to. I remember going to. And we um, want people to. We want people to. To realise that. Yeah. To, to think. Yeah, you, can, you come in and you have your own experience. We're not mm -hmm. telling you how to feel. Which actually, I think we've been very you know not we as in hard but in general yeah, yeah. as cultural mm -hmm. in institutions have been guilty of you know we think we know what's best but yeah. like going back to the you know aborigines mm -hmm. our, our idea that you know that we know yeah. the right thing or we know what culture is yeah. and it's just so how it's things just can get mistranslated uh, mm -hmm. reminds me of um about five or eight years ago i went to the uh, to versailles mm -hmm. and they had that series of um contemporary artists yeah. showing at the site and I went to see a Jeff Koons exhibition. I wondered if you were going to say that. <laughs> and, uh, and you know it was it was packed mostly yeah. with people I think who were not there to see Jeff Koons which were kind of dotted around the palace and I followed around this American family just we were moving at the same pace and also they were so fascinating <laughs> and they were complaining very loudly about these like Jeff Koons, these shiny Jeff Koons yeah. things being installed in these like different bedrooms and at one point, one of them said, like, this is about the stupidest thing I've ever seen. And I thought, well, well yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of the point with Jeff Koons' work anyway. It's kind of the <laughs> stupidest thing you can think of at the stupidest scale. But also, in the 1770s, these people would have been collecting Jeff Koons. Mm -hmm. Like, they would have been collecting Koons, yeah. they would have been collecting any of the other artists they're now reinserting, in there, like Takeshi Murakami or Anish Kapoor. Mm -hmm. These are the artists that would have been supported by that kind of generation. It's of a piece. There's a like, total continuum of what yeah. you do. Yes, and it was a kind of amazingly instructive thing to yeah. overhear that like, misunderstanding between where these works are coming from. It's like these are the today's baubles of power, basically. Yeah, yeah very much. Because it's, it's, it's yes. like, it's like Jeff Coombs always plays to that market. You yeah. Know? And that's the whole thing. It is about mm. the money, it's about the market. And it's, mm kind of shameless in a way and probably plays it in incredibly well yeah mm. but it's a shame. wearing his kind of wall street suit yeah, and the whole it, thing it yeah it's, you know and he's a he's a he's a kind of hookster you know he's yeah. just like a, you know and he's very clever he's fantastic yes. at what he does mm. you know and there's a and there's a i don't know there's a, depending on what you view there's a charm or a wit about it as well possibly but it's uh 
but it's the shiniest, blingiest, most incredible. They're, they're beautifully made. I mean, they're mm-hmm. absolutely, you know, mm-hmm. delightful in, t- in terms of how they're made. Where do you like them or not? It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I didn't see them in Versailles, but I can imagine them being absolutely mm-hmm. <laughs> fitting perfectly. Just play yeah, it was so perfect. perfect. So yeah. over the top. It was yeah. seamless. But, but, Vers- but yeah. Versailles, yeah. that's the whole sort of thing. It's all about power and ostentation. We can afford this, you know. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows how expensive a Jeff Koons is. Mm-hmm. And that's part of it. It's not just the piece. It's mm-hmm. about... It's mm-hmm. just what it signifies, the money. It's all yeah. about the status, isn't mm-hmm. it, I think. That's what I'm sort of finding really refreshing with Harwood as well, though, is the fact that they've got, right from the very beginning, they've had this, um, you know, this, this of, of sort of encouraging sort of new talent. So, for example, they supported, you know, they were um, commissioning um, Gerton and Turner before they were, you know, particularly Gerton, before they were successful. Mm-hmm. And it's a bit like, actually, the Devonshires with Freud, who mm-hmm. was who they knew they were friends with before he sort of, you know, became, you know, the well-known and revered artist that he was. And, mm. and, that's, and that's, what I, that's what I particularly love. Mm-hmm. It's when it's actually, it's actually looking for somebody, for, you know, working with unexpected people and actually some, on something completely new as well. Because you do, it's a very much a two-tone thing, isn't yeah. it? The majority of it is that status and that, Showing off yeah, is, but, but, and positioning yourself in the society, but then also you also get that that encouragement and that patronage of the unexpected, which but, I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. But, but I think Chatsworth quite is very interesting for that. And we we look at go back to the talk of there last year and and just stop the night and yeah. uh, and we walk around these kind of back rooms and corridors and it's just you know it's just wall upon wall of the most amazing sort of things. Yeah. Like contemporary art, you know, plus the kind of old masters. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, but he, he's he's really interesting fellow that Stoker. He anyway. is. And, uh, <laughs> he's but the, Stoker's the Duke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and and when when you walk around with him, <coughs> and uh, so you, you're walking past these things, and he's and he's quite dismissive of some of these things, which are probably priceless. He goes, "Oh, that was my father, and a bloody disgusting piece of work." And, <laughs> and, and, and then he goes to another room, and uh, there's all these plates on the wall, and yeah. they look really fantastic. We just bought them in a car boot sale, and he mm-hmm. said, "Well, they all work. They're all of a, a certain kind of colour and a certain sort of texture." <laughs> And I really like them, but their inherent value is, is, is mm-hmm. you know, it's nothing. It's like a few pounds each. But yeah. as, a, as a statement, and because of the context you see them in chats mm-hmm. with, you, also, you kind of imbue them with a, oh, they must be really rare, they must be mm-hmm. really expensive. Mm-hmm. And because they're, there. because they're in yeah. chats with, so, so the context, you, you look at them in a completely different way. He goes, oh, no, the cheapest chips, but I really like them. And, and that's quite interesting with him. Yeah. So he does, I don't want to say subvert it, but it's, 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 it's oh, plays subversion with it. Subversion is definitely, yeah. oh, definitely, there's a real yeah. subversive mm-hmm. streak yeah. there. And that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's really lo- interesting. I always love that. And that's really interesting. Really thing. subversive, yeah. not unexpected, mm-hmm. a real sense of humour as yeah. well. Because he's, not, very, not pompous cause he's very cheeky, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely, which I, which was always a really yeah. great fun to work with and, and, work, and working with him on sort of the, the collection and, and where he was acquiring, particularly with the con- within contemporary mm-hmm. decorative arts as well mm-hmm. as fine arts as well, was fascinating. It might be somebody that was down the road in Bakewell, or it could be, you know, sort of somebody who's, you know, the top Australian ceramicist of our generation. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't really, there wasn't a difference for him. And and we used to have conversations and he'd say, well, I'm not, um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a collector. People would say, oh, he's a great collector. And he'd say, well, I'm not a collector. He said, I just, I have what I love. And he said, I can't call myself a collector. If people decide in the future that I am, that's, that mm-hmm. late, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. But actually, I just acquire things I like, and what for him, it's about the people as well. And it's the stories, and then that, that's what makes it interesting, I think, rather than accumulation yeah. of what's mm. yeah. received as, as, as the best of, you know, contemporary yeah. know, Western art or, or, or whatever it is. It's that mishmash of sort mm. of things which gives it a personality when you kind of go in it. And that's what makes yeah. it feel real, I think, you know. And that's, I think, some of the strengths of these houses as well, that it is, there is that sense of personality or that individual in particularly the ones, you know, the ones that are sort of still mm-hmm. lived in and have those sort of family links, I think. But, but again, in terms of patronage as well, so when it came mm-hmm. to a major ceramic um, uh, commission, and we actually ended up with going with this um, maker, Jekyll van der Boegel, who, who actually hadn't had a major commission before. And it was a three-year investment in him and his process, enlarging his studios, that he'd be able to make a commission on that scale. And I thought that was just brilliant to, mm-hmm. to do that. And it was about the relationship. It was actually about the talking to the, to the, to the artist and the maker that was the really interesting thing for, for him. Um, and the, the briefs would always often be very, very 
loose and very vague at Chatsworth as well, which was quite difficult to artists. And even Michael Craig Martin, when he came in, with all his experience, he was sort of like, I don't really think I want to mess with this house too much. Mm-hmm. I might just stay outside. And they were like, no, no, come indoors. I'm, I'm interested in asking, because yeah. we've been talking a bit about archives as these kinds of morphing spaces that are often changing with the people, with the personnel. But I think we're also kind of assuming that archives have always been like that. So I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about actually when did this idea in the West of an archive start to emerge? Because I don't know. But then, just but before we get to that, I'm kind of interested in these, these houses that you're talking about. When did they first start to be thrown open to the public? Well, that's the thing. They've always, most of them have always been open, the big ones. Mm-hmm. Oh, they? Yeah, always have. So you go back to, um, they would always, they would usually be um, a day a week where anybody could present themselves at the door and they would be fed and shown round. But even, so when, even when they were first built? The 16th, yeah. 17th oh, century. Right. Yeah, and that was how the housekeepers used to make a lot of money because obviously these houses like Chatsworth was only lived in for maybe at two points in the year because they had, at one point, I think they had 11 estates and they were just on this permanent tour, you know, tour yeah. of yeah. all their estates to check all their different but so houses, why did basically, <laughs> and clear out the sewer, you know. But the, so it was a know, kind of secret, it was a secret business proposition for yeah, people Yeah, and they used, to keep, they used to sort of keep it. Yeah, so there was um, a housekeeper, she's actually, Mrs Hackett, she's actually painted on the ceiling in the state, um, in the great chamber in the state apartment, the first room you go oh, she's into. she's the one who the artist didn't like. Exactly, there was an Italian artist, Antonio Verio, so this is 1690s, okay. and he, they fell out because he was constantly, you know, he, he wanted pasta, he was very difficult about his meals, <laughs> yeah. he was going out to local tavern, he was drinking too much, he was getting involved with the local women, and you can imagine this sort of housekeeper yeah. with her rod of iron, yeah, yeah. she looks quite fearsome. Um, you know, they fell out big time. And so he immortalised her as um, cutting the thread of life. <laughs> <laughs> She's all in black. She looks, <laughs> she looks completely embittered. Right. She so, really yeah. looks like this real crone, you know, and you yeah. think, is that fair? I don't know, who, who knows? Um, but yeah, that was how they supplemented their, their income, was oh, by, tour, by, was by tours. Like a post-war thing where they were kind of running yeah. out of money. I assumed yeah. that too. Well, yeah, no, I mean, on that, on that sort of scale. But no, it's always been the case. But it's interesting in the 19th century, you through it and they they have to they have to hand their wages in from that and then it gets given back by the mistress of the house. Right. Oh really? It huh. becomes more formalised and yeah, tickets yeah, yeah. and then and then you get I think it was Horace uh, Walpole that issued the first guide to his collection mm-hmm. um, because his father's collection, the first Prime Minister Robert Walpole, his collection was dispersed and you know I think Catherine the Great of Russia she acquired most of it and he was quite devastated by that this idea of this ephemeral collection that is yeah. not stuck in time and it can get broken yeah. up and so when he got his own collection together he wrote sort of a guide to it so that there actually something would remain. So when would this some have sort been? When are we so this is in the sort of, oh God, I'm terrible with dates for a curator. Uh, so this is 1700, sort of second, mm. sort of maybe sort of around 1770, second yeah. half, something like that. And this was at Strawberry But that's interesting because that's at the time then of the emergence of public museums in, in yes. the West, right, or in Western Europe that at this moment when kind of princely collections are getting turned into yeah. public collections, yeah. whether it, that's by the French Revolution and the Louvre mm. getting turned over to the public, or, or yeah. whether it's um, that these museums are actually starting to be built in the 1780s. And they're kind of in tandem yeah. with that. They're starting to think of these private houses as... And actually being a resource as well. But, you know, I mean, yeah. they would open them up. People, you know, people, they would be, you know, sort of like a library for people to come and look at. You know, but um, I mean, not everybody, obviously. <laughs> you mm. know, mm. majority of the population was working seven days a week. It you know, sort of six, six sure, till midnight. Yeah. So you know, they're not yeah. going to be able to yeah. read books or even have the time to to read books. Yeah, but yeah. but it's um, yeah. So they've they've always they've always been open. They've mm. always sort of been hospitable. There's always been this sense that you uh, this sense of obligation. I think that's what you get with estates before so the welfare mm-hmm. system. They were. The welfare system for mm-hmm. rural for their communities. Right. They they were the employer. Whether the conditions, obviously, you know, in our eyes today, harsh, to say the very least. Um, but it was that understanding that if you looked after the family, they would look after you. Yeah. And even the village that I lived in until mm-hmm. quite recently, there were people retired there who had always worked at Chatsworth and they had houses for life. 
Um, so it was sort of carrying right. on to this, mm. to this, to this day. Um, but it's an interesting point about museums as well, because you know, like the British Museum, founded on the Hans Sloane collection. So again, individuals. Yeah. Starting off with one person's. Yeah. Collection and then growing from yeah. from that. So starting out, it's extraordinary to think of something like that starting from one or two yeah. individuals as well, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and in the US, I guess with the kind of what the industrialists and robber barons and so on. Yes. I mean, they are they're at the basis of most of the kind of major well, mm. East Coast anyway museums, yeah. right? Yeah. The Fricks, the yes, whoever else. Who bought Melons. stuff from the um, Devonshire collection? Oh, really? It was talking about archives. There was something in the archive, and the the tenth duke arranged it, I think, and and they never talked about price. It was through a through a um, an intermediary, and it just wasn't it just wasn't the polite thing to yeah. talk about money. Mm -hmm. And you're going, my God, did you really let them go for that little? <laughs> 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 but it wasn't polite yeah, yeah, yeah. to talk money. But yeah, I had I'm a question. I had a question to which I have no idea of the answer, but. Yeah, if we're thinking in, in Europe, like when does this idea of the archive go back to? I feel quite I comfortable really with thinking know. about kind of histories of museums mm. and galleries, but archives, I don't know. I don't, I don't. I really don't know the answer no. to that. I think it's one interesting thing that I've seen just within my, my working lifetime mm. is the fact that actually when I came to it, archives weren't valued and mm -hmm. actually what I realized latterly what I'm experiencing is that actually they are now they now have a monetary worth which they never had before mm -hmm. so so when a major sort of valuation has been done in the past going back a few decades there was no value given to an archive mm -hmm. in the last 10 years there has been and suddenly actually they are now dis it's now been decided they are worth a lot of money right Right. Whereas they never had a, a value, a financial yeah. value on them, yeah. even in, in my time. Yeah, that's interesting. Which is extraordinary, but yeah. the history of archives, I, I have no idea. Yeah, if we were to speculate, what, I mean, how might they have kind of emerged? When I, when I looked up the word archive beforehand, I saw that it came from, there was a Greek root, I think, okay. arche, yeah, arche, which had inbuilt some sense of a public, publicness to it. Okay. So I guess it is kind of a sense of it always being a kind of public yeah. record rather than a kind of private collection. That's, that's yeah. the difference between a collector and an, an archive, isn't it? Yeah. But it's a lot got of to collections some become archives, don't they? Well, that's the thing, mm -hmm. and, and you sort of think, well, why, why does someone collect? Is it, is it for a personal obsession? Mm -hmm. or, or is it something to kind of then show off to the world, look how amazing mm. I am or how rich I am or mm. how interesting I am or how travelled I am and so, so why do people collect and is it like that and then, then, then I suppose why, why does it then become an archive as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go, I think we failed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> breakdown, yeah. <laughs> but it is an interesting point because I was thinking well does it t happen around the time of the Enlightenment when they're starting to rationalise everything mm. but then you know, I mean, before documents were kept for a reason, like you know, like land, tax, you, and, yeah, and, and yeah, and things like that. But but yeah. then, if there are documents going back, so I mean, so Chatsworth is going from so like the mid fifteen hundreds, mm -hmm. first Chatsworth before this current one was built, in the sixteen eighties onwards, and but there are there are documents going so far back. So there was obviously this sense that you needed to keep sure. letters and so on from and account books from Elizabethan times yeah. even when you even sort of you know I guess the kind of fam the later, famous case of Shakespeare later. right of us not knowing really anything much about Shakespeare's mm -hmm. life but what we do know is the kind of the bills of sale and so on that mm -hmm. it's really like well we know he was here because he was selling this house to this person and so on but mm -hmm. these things were not being kept because he was understood to be of importance which he was mm -hmm. actually by the end of his life but but just because there were kind of public records and there was a mm. sense of importance to that. I guess archives are often assembled in a, they're not thought of as archives until maybe the person involved dies or, or starts to yeah. think of it as an archive. You know, that, mm. that a collection, whether or not you think of yourself as a collector, you're, you're kind of saying, I am spending money and time on this pursuit. Yeah. Whereas an archive, if you're a writer, it's just, it's the stuff mm. that you, I wonder if it's got anything to do with um, kind of modernity and otherness mm -hmm. and about whether, you know, those collections from the first people who went to America or, mm. you know, or Africa or wherever, 
whether those collections and that sense of let's show the rest of the country what are the nests, which I guess sure, is what yeah. you're saying yeah, is I'd part of the, the museum's mm. beginning of the museum. It is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember kind of in a, in a very well, contemporary archive that I was looking at once in New York was related to the artist collective group Material, who were very active in New York in the 80s and then kind of stopped in the early 90s. And their archive was given to, I think, New York University. Mm. And I was really fascinated by it, by this because, you know, this kind of collective artist group working in tiny project spaces, shop front spaces and so on, having very little sense that what they were going to be doing would have any kind of importance for the kind of subsequent decades for posterity. And, um, and also, tragically, this was the generation of, of AIDS mm. wiping out kind of whole yeah. communities of artists in New York. So a number of group material all died in the late 80s and early 90s. So the archives really were just kind of whatever was left behind. It was like scraps and remnants mm. and so on, so on. And so when it got to, it sounded rather grand, this idea of it being an archive at NYU, but really it was cardboard boxes of flyers and so on, yeah. typewritten minutes from meetings of people bickering about <laughs> how best, you know, and these were kind of... That's the fascinating Absolutely. Bit. That's the bit that this is a quite a kind of about. radical bunch yeah. of young artists and writers, and, and the, um, the notes are fantastically boring, yeah. you know, <laughs> about because they're thinking about how they can uh, coordinate, collaborate in a kind of yeah. anti-hierarchical way. But you get these kind of radical politics, but underpinning it is just this, like, boredom of... <laughs> bureaucracy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with which we might be familiar I mean, if you go back to your story at the beginning yeah. um, about the curation yeah and about how people you know might in the future curate that sort of those bits mm. out that they don't want you know in the same way that we're talking about um, slave trade legacy or whatever mm. and it's kind of what people then do with those archives sure, yeah. and what the what are the bits that we value um right now what might people value in 10 or 15 years mm. time so you know the concept of oral histories has been um you know one that's being valued at the moment and in 10 years time oral histories may not be valued yeah, and, yeah. Mm. you know what will happen to those things that, that have been collected by libraries around the country mm. what will be the next thing and those kind of the way things move on and grow and accumulate and then i suppose we've been talking about your job haven't we and about you you in a, a sort of a long line of curators at Chatsworth yeah. and about your values and your interests getting them sort moment of, in the sun yeah. sort of thing yeah I've been thinking a lot recently about the question of um deaccessioning or when when museums mm. sell or believe they have the right to sell parts of their collection mm. and in the west definitely there's always been this idea that that's absolutely not allowed mm. that this that this is a kind of cultural repository, cultural value that cannot be translated then into kind of financial things. And then in the last 10 years or since the financial crisis, a number of museums in North America have deaccessioned large proportions of their collection because mm -hmm. they've had them valued. They've said, we know we've got $500 million worth of art here. Why don't we kind of sell some of this mm -hmm. to keep the lights mm -hmm. on? And it's been a big debate. And I think the kind of weight of opinion still comes down on the side of, well, you just can't do this because it opens the kind of door to you know all kinds yeah. of things but I was listening to an interview recently with Glenn Lowry the, the long-standing director of MoMA who said quite controversially that he thinks deaccessioning is okay he said he's alone in this in MoMA but his his reason is that he said you know you're trying to build a coherent collection that's got to be as strong as it possibly can be people make mistakes over time mm -hmm. So as long as the kind of sales of works from the collection are being put only towards the acquisition of new works, he was like, I don't have a problem with it. I think maybe that's the key, though, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's about when it comes to covering running costs. If it's so operational, yeah. If it's then operational, then, because I know, because there was the museum that uh, was a couple of years ago now that was, de you know, that was sort of deaccessioned or yeah. lost its accreditation. Yeah. Because it's odd, because where I work now at Harvard, it's actually an accredited museum. Right. And... A family collection. So does that mean you're actually not and permitted to business. the accession? In the um, UK? I th oh God, now you've got me there. There's a lot of paperwork I still need to read. Because <laughs> <laughs> actually, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it, it depends again about who owns because there's an awful lot that's on loan to sure, the trust okay. yeah. there, the, yeah. rather than being owned by it as well. Yeah. So it's 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 an incredibly complex 
arrangement a lot more complex than I was used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and, and I just um, had to, I think in the first sort of two months, I had to sign off on 10-year rolling loan agreements for thousands of objects mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. which was just sort of slightly mind blowing to, mm -hmm. to get to get mm -hmm. my get my head around but so and it's an in, it's an interesting thing because it's you know it's something that is definitely a part of been a part of my working life and it's amazing how emotional you can get about it as well yeah i think because you realize how much you invest in the things that surround you i remember there was one particular old master drawing um that went off on loan and it never came back is it because a decision was taken that it was to be sold? Uh huh. And you didn't get to say goodbye. And isn't that that was well? You're taking the words out of my mouth. That's what I was saying. And it, isn't that isn't that ridiculous? It was a piece of paper with a drawing on it, and uh -huh. I and I was upset that I never got to see it uh -huh. before it went. I didn't uh -huh. get to say goodbye. Uh -huh. And that's like it's a friend, rather than rather than a sheet of paper. So yeah, I don't know yeah. what that says about but, but, me. Yeah. I felt a real sense of loss yeah. about that, irrespective of whether I thought it was the right decision. There was sort of almost, I felt a sort of a brutality mm. in how it was, my, my, you know, my relationship with mm. that work had just, had sort of mm -hmm. gone and I didn't realise but, but it was going. In some ways why we collect, why we have heirlooms, why we have these things to make us feel alive and, mm. and almost, because maybe it's uh, because we're maybe and maybe more in the West really scared of dying and the fact that <laughs> we're we're flesh we're bone we're going to go back to dust and by mm. almost having these things these objects they kind of define us they kind of uh, distract us from the thing that we are going to die we're going to go yeah. back mm -hmm. back to, to dust and, and almost then by ha by having an heirloom I don't say, like a watch from your father and you pass it on to your to mm -hmm. your son or your daughter it's, it's this yeah. sense that. There's, there's more to life than just you just kind of going mm. back, back to dust. These things are guarantees yeah, somehow, yeah, but even though, as, as yeah, Amanda, yeah. Amanda and Hannah yeah. said, these collections are kind of dying on a material mm. level too, yeah, right? Sorry. They're almost like little anchors. I think there's so much truth mm. in what you've said just now. And, mm. and there are little anchors in that, isn't it, about, about your sort of, and I, about how you stay alive or, or, or something. And I know that somebody close to me lost uh, a parent and their only sibling within a couple of months of each other just a few months ago and and it was just that um, just that that I don't know what it, it, it was it was just such an extraordinary thing there when you when it you sort of got to do look at the funeral and what was going to be said and the things that came in the um, condolences cards it's mm. this person is still alive as long as you're thinking of them yeah. mm -hmm. and things like that all these sort of um, platitudes which are lovely and well-meaning and actually do mean a lot to you when you've lost somebody mm -hmm. but actually you just sort of think again it's that slightly it's that slightly kidding yourself actually yeah. you know that they, they, we don't want to accept that actually we do go and that those and close to us go and maybe that comes up to the whole thing about compost because because even mm -hmm. when you say when you think of compost it's something you know it's like kind of fetid or rotten or smelly and sort of mm -hmm. stuff but that's, it's a very natural kind of sort of process mm -hmm. and almost in a way if you accept that, that that's mm. kind of what happened. It's not a bad smell. Mm. It's just a natural smell. That's just the mm. way of, of the earth. But mm. it's, it's and and then, and then maybe that's that's the sort of thing. But yeah, between that, maybe the idea of it, compost and archives. These sort of things are dying. But but what is it? Mm. Yeah. Maybe that's what's unsettling about this kind of idea of an archive that gets lost or damaged or destroyed or deaccessioned or broken up. That mm. there is within it some kind of tether, yeah. or we like to mm. think of as a kind of continuity mm. and then when that cord is cut <coughs> it's is that marker in the sand saying I was here mm. isn't it and I can remember going to um, when I was living in London and going to the local street market and there would just be um, there would just be people's you know that awful, that thing when you go to you know like a car boot or something like that when you see people's wedding photographs in a frame yeah. mm -hmm. and somebody's just selling off the frame or in an antique shop and you just think well who was that person mm -hmm. my god that was on yeah. somebody's Chimney piece probably once right, it meant a right. lot, and I can remember going to one stand and and <laughs> in this local local market. And the reason I got is we'd just been burgled, and the police said, "Well, you'll probably find out find if you go to the local market, some of your stuff will reappear." And I went along, and there was you know there was this um, there was somebody's pills. There was like their you know like you know yeah. just their their prescription there mm -hmm. you know sort of on this table amongst all this other sort of you know stuff that wasn't mm -hmm. worth very much. And I was mm -hmm. like, my God, that's the intimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah 
pieces of somebody's life that's just on this, yeah. you know, this trestle table in the middle of the East of the East End. I think you know? yeah. and it was, it was, oh, it was There's really There's something there about randomness. I was, I was going to say exactly that same word. Thinking yeah. about this, at the, I, I was in um, Berlin at the weekend and I went to the Gemelda Gallery for the first time, the kind of the painting museum in the, in the west of Berlin. And yeah, I'd never seen a collection before and I hadn't realised they've got two Vermeers, which is, you know, big deals. There are only about 30 or so around the world. And I was looking at it and one of these paintings and just thinking Vermeer died pretty penniless, pretty much unknown. And his work was not thought of mm. for 200 years, really. And it was like, so all of the collections that, that it's in now, the Rights Museum, uh, the National Gallery has one, like the Louvre, the Met, da da da. These all only acquired them in the kind of early 20th century. There was a kind of 250 year gap to which, like, Vermeer's kind of journey towards becoming probably now one yeah. of the most adored, revered, best known mm. painters, certainly of kind of that period. And, and that was just because of the work of one art historian who thought he was pretty good in the 1880s, yeah. so kind of put together a catalogue resume. And if this kind of, back to this question a bit of deaccessioning, if, if things had gone another way, you could yeah. very well have seen Vermeer falling out of favour had he been acquired to start with and being rampantly deaccessioned in the 19th century and he would have totally been lost, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of question of deaccessioning is like, well, yeah, but whose call is it? You, you can make the call now and like, this does not feel yeah. so irrelevant right now. I'm going to get rid of Jeff Koons or whatever it is. But it can change But who's everything. to say? But, but, yeah. it can, but, but yeah. he can use that. I was, I was, it's a similar thing I was going to suggest as well. It's kind of the, the whole thing about, I don't know, even like philosophy. I mean, mm. the things which have kind of, which, which, which are still around, like, you know, so Aristotle and Plato. Mm. And, but a lot of those Greek philosophers, they were destroyed by the Romans and the Greeks because they didn't, and the Christians because it didn't fit in with their, mm. their worldview. And it's mm -hmm. kind of heretical. So like, is it like one guy's Demetricus? And then, Apparently, he wrote these most amazing books, and all we get is just bits of poems written by his, his uh, descendants and students. Mm. And apparently, if his stuff was around, it probably could possibly change the way we think about the world. But it's kind of completely mm. gone. It's just completely destroyed. And, yeah. And and how we see the world is based on how it is, well, not curated, but how it was informed politically or uh, religiously, and that's how mm. we sort of see, see the world. Because people have made those decisions at certain points, yeah. points in We're time. We're back to negative space again, yeah. I think. Yeah. You know, I think of something like the Sappho's famous fragments, and we're kind of, they're so beautiful <laughs> to us now yeah. because they read like modernist poetry yeah. from the 20s, mm. these like disjointed yeah. little lines, and we know they were part of a much bigger whole, yeah. but then there are whole other schools or philosophers that we don't even know We don't know about, and, 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 but, even how, just mm. gone, but even how we kind of, how we maybe sort of see those really and a beautiful kind of Greek statue, say for example, they're all white and pure, yeah. and but, 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 but they're all really decorated at yeah. yeah. the time and really kind of gay, well, apparently quite really garish. garish yeah. Colors, yeah. And now we sort of see them as white and pure as minimum, almost this kind of the most, the, 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 the essence of the human form, you know, yeah. and mm -hmm. they, they were very different how they were kind of, you know, yeah. made then and how they were don't know, meant to be appreciated to how we appreciate them. And it's, mm -hmm. it's been, it's, you know, things do change with mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wolf, I wanted to ask you a little bit about about kind of, I suppose, living archives, and maybe just to ask you to talk a bit about this project with the tree, right. with the apple tree, that I know is kind right. of on your mind at the moment, because I suppose reflecting on this conversation, right. yeah, it feels like there's a connection somehow. Uh, well, well, this is a, a project I'm working on at the moment, so in Southwold is the original Bramley, first of a Bramley apple tree which all Bramley apples have kind of sort of uh, have come from and it's and it's dying it's got some rare fungus it's, just, oh, it's got yeah. the reckon between two or three years left left to, left to live and so, so th there's been lots of uh, grafts you know so, so there's uh, other trees which have been sort of grafted like from this obviously yeah. but this this is the original this is original piece and yes yeah, so this bit of work I'm uh, proposing uh, to do is to is to grow a new orchard uh, and then put accelerometers and sensors on this new orchard, and then sensors and accelerometers to measure the vibrations on the uh, on the dying tree, mm. and then we're going to express these vibrations as light and sound in a sculpture. So, and and the the, uh, the actual key which the, which the tree resonates in is, is in a C. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
so I've been to work already with like musicians. So do all trees resonate in C? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> this, this one does. <laughs> this is one. But a, a lot of things do. A lot of things connected with the earth resonate in C. So, so like the bees really? do, say for example. And uh, uh -huh. so it does feel that, that there's a lot of things which resonate in C. So there is mm -hmm. something quite. It appears to be quite elemental. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, yes, yeah, so the, the idea with with this project is. Uh, that these sounds, lights will be documented, so so, you, so the the viewer, the audience will get to hear what's happening with this new orchard growing, and that'll be in a C minor, or the or the, the, the noises which will trigger, and then the dying tree will be in a, uh, sorry in a C minor, the the dying one, and the the, the living ones will be in a C major. So it so it documents the oh the goodness. death of one and the dying of another, and but but in a way that's because it's going to go, it's going to kind of die. I suppose it's uh, maybe allowing. The, the view of the audience to, to to experience that to feel it rather than going to see the tree seeing a plaque this tree mm -hmm. this tree is dying it the way it is you can either say it's sad or it's good or but that's the way it is but somehow by internalizing it and it maybe goes a little bit back to what we we're talking about before about noise and smell and these and touch if you can have these sensations inside your body rather than mm -hmm. some, when you look at things obviously inside your body but it, it's, a, it's a, they're almost we all, almost overuse our visual sight yeah. and I think uh, by using yes yeah, sort of sense of sense and touch and mm -hmm. noise uh, they can be incredibly powerful because they're quite latent I think a lot of us I mean say mm -hmm. 100 years ago like sort of smell would have been so much more important just with, you'd use it every day to sort of, is your food rotten yeah can, mm -hmm. rather than looking at your, your use by date <laughs> and, but, but you, you only have to have one smell and it can kind of come from nowhere and immediately you can be transported back to your grandma's mm -hmm. house back in Bremen in 1973 and you're just there completely mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and more so sometimes than, than a picture or more because yeah. we're so bombarded think, by visual images yes I suppose with, with, with this project it's it's a, it's, it's a lot in a way it's a it's a, it's a it's documented something which is living and dying, so it is its kind of own kind of archive. And then I suppose mm. that the, the idea would be recording this o over time. There'd be a database which will actually be recording, you know, the dying tree and the growing sort of tree, which again for posterity might be an interesting thing. But but and, and I suppose that what I'm interested is that it's that it's in the now. I suppose and it, it goes mm. back to what you were sort of saying, you know, in when you go to archives and museums to have that emotional connection with something rather than just like an intellectual or yes. a visual connection yeah. something which mm -hmm. makes you feel yeah. I suppose that's one of the big things about and then, then hopefully this idea that you may be reconnected with the earth with yourself with the fact that you know that we're all going to die yeah. Yeah. and we're all kind of part of it I suppose and maybe if you can have this kind of connection with nature and your sort of self you know maybe that's a helpful thing to be you know yeah. rather than be so kind of disconnected and maybe it goes back to this this thing we talked before, you know, this age of the Anthropocene, where, where mm -hmm. it's kind of we see ourselves so kind of distant and disconnected from nature, but you know, but uh, but we are, you know, we're, we're, as, we're as much as nature as as a uh, as a tree or the ocean. Really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What right. kind of form will the project take? Uh, well, 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 the, the, well, the first uh, is is to, is to do the sound. So, so, mm -hmm. so, the, so the first sort of thing is, is to do a sort of be a, like a live soundscape. That'll be that'll be the first thing. And then it'll hopefully be, be expressed as a uh, as a as a space. So so these uh, these sort of signals will be will be transmitted uh, to a physical space. The lights and the sort of sound. So it'll be in a place almost of kind of contemplation. Wow. So that's so that's how mm -hmm. it will be physically. Mm -hmm. And and that's if we get to that point, and we hope to. But mm -hmm. even if it doesn't, it will be expressed as, as this uh, yeah as, as as a soundscape as a, as a living soundscape. Are there any are there any other trees near this? This um, Bramley tree, Bramley apple tree, as uh, well, or is it sort of on its own in a? What's it? It's, a, it's a weird little place. It's, it's like an old little courtyard, and uh, oh, it's the back of a house, virtually opposite the Minster, and it doesn't look particularly sort of like sort of special. I mean, there's yeah. other trees around it, but they're kind mm -hmm. of like new conifers and sort of stuff like that. So it's not part of a wood or anything like this. Yeah, excuse me, and it was kind of grown in, in, in this, this back uh, this back garden. Mm -hmm. and Nottingham Trent University had bought it, I think, for. Again, for, poster for posterity, mm -hmm. because there's this idea that this this tree will will die, and I think what will probably happen, and we've got a 3D scan of the tree, so we'll, it'll probably get cast in some point, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's a one to one scale or one to two, whatever, whether, it's, whether that's in bronze or resin or whatever. Yeah. So there'll be a physical representation of, of, of the tree, but it's just like a snapshot of what that tree looked like, mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than what that tree 
is, I suppose, and yeah. was, and I suppose then that goes back a bit to that whole idea of animism. It's, mm -hmm. it's just what I'm sort of trying to do with this is trying to express the essence of, the, of this tree rather than what it looks like or what it signifies, kind of mm. what it yeah. is, I suppose. But I hadn't realised that um, until recently that trees communicate with each other yeah, through, through their fungi. roots. Yeah, through roots and the fungi. Yeah. I thought kind of that, into that was extraordinary. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and I was. And I always think as well, you know, sort of about, we, you know, they say that we only use, what percentage of our brain that we use? It's a, it's a minority, That's isn't tight. it? Mm -hmm. And you just think, well, it's very little in the body, you know, that, that isn't of, of use. And you just mm -hmm. think, well, again, it's that idea of what have we lost? What, what are we not, what are we missing? What have we not understood? Yeah. Like, like learning, lo I've, you know, I've been learning a bit more about trees in the last yeah. year or so. Mm -hmm. and, and just thinking all this knowledge that we're not aware of yeah, that we're rediscovering. And then, yeah, mm. so you sort of think, well, is it latent? Is it inside us already? Or mm. is it something... Something's been forgotten. Forgotten, or, or is it something which we potentially might need to use in the future? We, we might need to use all this, because there's sort of things yeah. like a, our appendix and our tail, mm. you know, through evolution, we get rid of sort of stuff which we don't need, you know, mm. but we've still got this massive capacity to think and to kind of dream. Yeah. And, and so this idea we deaccessioned our appendixes. But through evolution, you, you yeah. sort of think, well, you, you only use what's necessary. So, so why have we still got this incredible yeah, yeah. capacity to, you know, to think, to dream, to rationalize? But that idea yeah. of like future potential, because yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess we, when we think about this idea that we don't use much of our brain or whatever it is, it's always this like, oh, what ancient knowledge have we lost? Yeah. But yes. I like this idea of <laughs> future <laughs> being yeah. future facing. If like we're primed yeah. for what happens next. Yeah. It is. But, yeah. Um, but I guess I guess we do. I don't know. I suppose that's being a maker, being involved in making. There is that that embodied knowledge, isn't there? That isn't. I mean, it, the, I'm not. It, I don't know enough about how the brain's used to know if if I'm making sense or not. But um, you know, when you're making things, when I'm printing. Mm. You know, it's actually my body is telling me if I'm holding the squeegee at the right angle and the noises that I'm mm. hearing, you know, I know if I, if I haven't put enough pressure on and the noise of the screen hit and the ink hitting the paper mm. or the fabric, um, I don't know whether that's my brain or my body or whether that's mm. feeling. It's probably both, it's like muscle memory, isn't it? It's, you know, and and yeah. it, it almost becomes the two things sometimes become... And, that, one, and that's the bit, isn't it, that people are mesmerised about lace making or any other making mm. that people mm -hmm. make. It is, you know, how did how did somebody do that? How did somebody have that mm. knowledge to to make that? And I think a lot of that, and that's why it takes practice and a long time to do something, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. you've got to develop that muscle memory mm. or you know mm. whatever that embodied knowledge is um, in terms of how you can and make. It isn't part of that why there is still this belief that craft can be taught but aren't, can't be taught. Yeah. Which yeah. doesn't yeah. go back that far, really. You know, we're talking like 100 years or something mm. like that, mm. because before that art was maybe mm. closer to craft or design. Mm. But that sense that you can teach something that's repeated, that's mm. muscle memory, whereas yeah. like creativity that's yeah. still more associated with the art side of the division is like cannot be taught. Yeah, and it's it's that. it is that sort of thing about the artist. And it's almost this idea of the artist <coughs> as the... I don't know, the savant or, or the, or the mm. genius or, or, or kind of almost on, a, on another sort of spiritual plane to other people mm -hmm. as well. And I don't particularly hold with that, but, but I, I think, this, especially in the 20th century, I think that was, and they're probably, probably sort of still now where you know, people are very much kind of compartmentalised. You know, you're mm -hmm. an artist, you're a designer, you're a, <laughs> a scientist, you're a musician, it's, it's this. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's very much a 20th century sort mm -hmm. of thing, where, whereas prior to that, you know, those, you know, those divisions you know, were, were a lot more vague and kind of, kind mm -hmm. of sort of great people would do different sort of things and mm. yeah because I think a, a lot of maybe what scientists and what artists do you know you, you search for similar things you know and and the, even like we've been kind of completely different for such a long time scientists were over there artists mm -hmm. over there novelists were over there so, and mm -hmm. but there's a real overlap about trying to make sense mm -hmm. of the world you know and, mm -hmm. and that's to me that's that's the really interesting yeah. a really interesting sort do of do you see that as shifting mm -hmm. that no, I, I, I do. I think personally, I do. I, I just sort of think because as as the world becomes more, as appears and probably is more kind of complicated, mm -hmm. you know, there isn't sometimes you can solve everything or work everything out mm. with just an just an artwork. So some if you have an artist and a, a scientist or an artist and a musician or you know, a musician or a scientist or whatever, I think those sort of things can try and make sense of the world more because mm -hmm. I think I mean even how arts change. I mean, art isn't 
just about you know like a painting or a sculpture or a video. It, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's it's about the idea really, mm -hmm. and, and it's and it's how to express that idea. You know what 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 is it all about? And sometimes you sort of think well the best way to think about this or to express this is to work with other people who know yeah. more about that area than, than you do. So you learn, and then maybe you'll yeah. suggest sort of things how you know. Uh, uh, your take on the world, and that would be very sli maybe slightly, slightly different to a scientist, and vice versa. But between you, with those kind of grey areas, you end up with these sort of, these sort of sparks, and you kind of end up over there, yeah. mm -hmm. which so is amazing, exactly you know. And, and it makes you feel like a like a kid, you know. Yeah. It makes you feel alive, you know. And it mm -hmm. makes you feel like you're part of the world yeah. rather than kind of zoning down zoning, in, in, yeah. into this kind of little box, you know. Yeah. I have to admit, this is yeah. where I get on my soapbox, and you know, somebody is going to have to stop me because I am so. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with what these. It used to. It dr it's driven me mad since I first got into museums. Mm -hmm. I can remember working with um, an education um, head of education, who said, "Well, yeah, because obviously I was decorative arts by that point." And she said, "Well, Hannah, you know, she said, um, um, fine. What is it? Decorative arts is uh, is prose, and fine art is poetry." Mm -hmm. And I thought, <laughs> and I've never forgotten it. And I sort mm -hmm. of felt, you know, I don't feel violent many times in my life, but I really could have sort of. <laughs> <laughs> smacked that mm -hmm. person at that point so I thought my god you're responsible for edu <laughs> the education mm -hmm. of everybody who crosses the threshold right. of this yeah. place and it absolutely wound me up chronic mm -hmm. something chronic and it's it's something that comes back and actually throughout my career and um and something we're doing at Harwood next year and um, next March working with a, a curator called Hugo McDonald and it, we're actually going to be challenging those hierarchies and I mean it was something that I tried to do back in 2015 at Chatsworth with an exhibition of contemporary seat furniture and bringing together of what was classed as art, design, and craft, and these false categorizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, what was really interesting back in 2015 is when I was talking to, to some journalists from, you know, if they were a craft journalist, they didn't get up, but they thought, well, that shouldn't be next to that. And I actually had somebody come to me and say, because we'd, um, we'd put a major commission by these uh, designers' war edges, Almost, almost next to a room with um, Sheffield Hallam students' chairs that we sort of funded. Mm -hmm. I said, well, Hannah, I think that rather weakened your exhibition, mm -hmm. putting those two together. And the fact that some were, it was interesting, some designers considered, you know, it was one that sort of flew in from Asia and, um, you know, and very much for him, he was the artist, but why was he next to something that you could get off the internet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, we were sort of playing with that and people found it really difficult, actually, in, within my organisation, but also then the people that came to critique it could mm -hmm. only look at it through their mm -hmm. lens, some, some of them, only some of them. And, and I just found, and there was sort of no blame attached to that in mm -hmm. my eyes. It was just fascinating that that's where people were. And these false, um, you know, sort of categories. And you go back to the 18th century, the 18th century interiors, mm -hmm. going back to sort of France, that was all mm -hmm. about an interior. The paintings, you know, you get an artist like Boucher, who's doing the paintings, he's doing the designs that go on the set of porcelain, he's doing theatre mm -hmm. designs, he's doing everything, and no one thing was higher than the other. But I think the split kind of happens after him, right? Or it's a kind of, basically, it it's a kind of romantic division. Yeah. But it's quite interesting, you go back to the Renaissance, though, and you get the artists are beginning to align themselves with mathematicians because mm -hmm. they want to elevate yeah. their status in society. Mm -hmm. And so they start, so, you know, with perspective and so on, and they actually start bring, working with mathematicians back then and then that sort of that that pushes that bumps them up mm -hmm. whereas they were seen very much as you know sort of not exactly lackeys but they really didn't have the status that they went on to enjoy by the end of the mm -hmm. renaissance as mm -hmm. well so it's sort of for me it sort of starts back it's it's then it's that sort of positioning that sort of jostling in society yeah, but i think maybe it's a bit of a generational thing as well I mean, like an, a, a, a similar kind of parallel back to that i was at this I could buy this art and architecture forum in London uh, back last uh, September, and it was talking about you know what is art, what is architecture, are the, what's the connection between, are they are they the same, are they not the same? And, mm -hmm. and it was interesting. There was a lot of kind of old school architects, you know, you know, quite famous, well respected, but a lot of them you know sort of seventies and eighties, mm -hmm. and there was someone well, you know architecture, it's, it's it's the most beautiful of the arts, and of course I'm an artist, everything I do is. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was kind of arguing against it. So was it maybe some of your buildings can be sculptural, but I wouldn't. They're not sculptures. I wouldn't sort of say they're up because you've got a brief. You know, mm -hmm. you've, you've got these really tight. You work into commission. You work into a commission. So say so, you know you wouldn't go and off your own back go and create a uh, uh, a building for a bank. Why on earth would, would you do that? You you might create a, a space which which you might want to. 
be in and do something in, but you wouldn't, you've got all these kind of restrictions. And, and that's very different maybe to an artist who will just want to do something regardless. Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully try and find money to do it. And sometimes there's a brief, but usually if it's a brief, I, you know, if, if it aligns with what I do in my practice, well then that's fine. But if it doesn't, I'll, I won't do it or you'll throw it away. And I think that's the difference I think, between an artist maybe and an architect. There's always a brief and mm. you're a slave to the brief, whereas an artist possibly will just rip it up and do <laughs> what mm. they want to do. You know? That's it. Architecture is the most contingent, isn't it, yeah. of the arts? That yeah. Whether it's brief, whether it's money, it's like yeah. it's yeah. they go where the money is. Yeah, and, and, and so it's very different. And, yeah. and, and there are overlaps you know that create spaces it's about texture form mm -hmm. light all these sort of things you know it's, it's mm -hmm. about an experience sometimes you know you know so, so i think there are overlaps between what sculpture can do and what architecture can do mm -hmm. so those oh, those gray areas i think are really mm -hmm. interesting but to say that uh, that they this architect was to say i'm an artist well i really disagree with that mm -hmm. and i'm not sort of saying that then and, and again that kind of goes back a bit to what i was saying about this this overlap and uh how we kind of categorise ourselves, but mm. I also sort of think it's it's difficult. I would say for myself, I wouldn't call myself a scientist, even though I work with sort of scientists. I mm. just sort of think we share similar kind of concerns. I think those concerns overlap, but we do define ourselves by titles, I suppose, for good yeah. and for bad, don't we? I think. I suppose it's that sense that you can, if you you know that. I suppose it's only when it gets to the point where it stops people from crossing those boundaries, Completely, yeah. and when people get pigeonholed, yeah. which always frustrates me as mm -hmm. well. And that sense that you can't. That it, right, you're sort of this one thing, and I, I think it's maybe not necessary. It's about the way that it matters to some people yeah, that yeah. I that can halt creativity, and a lot of time gets spent on sort of defining it and thinking about it, and and it is a way of of, of you know of, of 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 status, which and I just wish that that could you, you do need to term for things, don't you? Mm -hmm. But I wish that sort of the the importance that people put on certain terms over others. You know, but it's a very human thing, isn't it? You know, to make yourself feel better. Very often, you will denigrate I, I somebody else, or that's what a lot of fiction, non-fiction, I think, is a good example, right? That like it's, um, it feels like it's now quite distinct. There are awards for one, not the other. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really encouraged for novelists yeah. to also write essays or mm -hmm. vice versa. But if you look any further back, or like to the yeah birth of the novel in the 17th century it's like it's always mm. profoundly essayistic and essays likewise always very novelistic mm. you know but it's somehow preserved in these categories that yeah again rose not too long ago but there's a certain hierarchy that's still there which i mm. agree i think yeah. is collapsing now i think i think it's a bit it like especially it young uh, yeah i think and i think even with with a uh, i don't know say for example with documentaries say for example and and, and, and maybe maybe like the book in the novel, I mean, I sort of Navsgaard, and even like you know, Truman Capote, you know, th th this idea of like a real life story then becomes like a novel, and, mm. and it almost becomes there's more truth in that somehow, and because real life is so m often stranger than fiction, and, and it and it can reveal so much more sometimes, mm -hmm. and, and I think the last. I spent the last 10, 15 years in terms of like documentaries. I mean, like probably I watch as many documentaries now as I do films. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if they're done well, they're, they're absolutely amazingly yeah. sort of fascinating and, and almost have a, their own kind of narrative, but kind of reveal as, as much about the world as a, as, as a film can, mm -hmm. I think, you know. But I think and it can be time, tricky as well. Yeah. I mean, like, you, you mentioned Nausgaard, and, yeah. you know, over the course of that, how many novels, like yeah. six novel yeah. sequence yeah. about his life. Yeah. There was when maybe the third was translated into English. I was reading an interview with mm. him, and this, the interviewer was saying, you know what, the bit in the book where you're 12 years old and you're peeling potatoes yeah. and you're looking out the window and it's like a six-page passage yeah. of you peeling potatoes yeah. and your brother's walking towards the house across the field. And it's like the intense boredom of that, yeah. which is incredible to me, that you could put that in writing yeah. and that could only have been lived. And now Scott said, no, no, I made that up. <laughs> and the interviewer was like, you're a, mo you're a monster. Yeah, yeah. Like, what kind of person would actually make that yeah. up? And so I think there's some really interesting yeah, yeah. negotiations between kind of art and life and yeah. what you can kind of get away with. Because yeah, it's, it's incredibly selective anyway. I mean, how you rem mm. remember things anyway is mm. completely selective depending on how you are anyway. Mm -hmm. So you're always going to embellish it. And you mm -hmm. know, it's like sometimes you write certain sort of things so many times, so that almost becomes a memory, becomes the truth, whether it really happened or not. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting what you, what, what you say about that, but then you sort of mm -hmm. think, well, is it, is he trying to write a, a bigger truth? Is, is it, a, mm -hmm. is, is it mm -hmm. an atmosphere he was trying to con convey? But, mm -hmm. but then you sort of think, well, that's straying back into fiction rather mm -hmm. than kind of non-fiction. But, but I think that it's, it's those boundaries, I think, which... Some, something on. occurs to me to kind of loop back to our earlier conversation. Couldn't archives lie? 
Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And how? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, everything that comes down to this has been edited by someone, hasn't it? It goes back to sort of what you're talking about, Barbara Hepworth's studio mm -hmm. and other things that we've sort of talked about as well. And well, they do say history is history is is written. It's it, you know by it's written by the winners. The, by the, the winners. winners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so absolutely, they can they can mm. lie. I would say because they're kind of polyvocal, right? But then often there will be an editor or, or someone. Things will have been destroyed. So, mm. I mean, archives I've, I've worked with, so for example, um, with the Devonshire Archive, there's a period in the 1820s, which was when a huge amount of collecting and alteration was going on at Chatsworth, all gone. It was probably destroyed between by the Victorians. Mm -hmm. um, it was at the time, I think, when the Duke had a mistress and not much sort of survives mm. about that. I don't know what else was going on, but they've often, you know, and, and a lot of it, is, you know, a lot of um, Georgina, the fifth Duchess, um, you know, a lot of her work was, you know, was actually, you know, redacted as well. You know, you can't, you couldn't read. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody had gone back and crossed it all out. That's the one that the film was made. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one. Yeah. Um, but they would literally destroy things as well. So actually, you end up getting that only what somebody else deems acceptable to survive. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. lose that sense of more than one voice sometimes. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. and you, sometimes you're aware that you've lost it, and other times you aren't, which mm -hmm. is interesting. So. How much yeah, was taken out yeah. of the equation? And I, you know, and I'm sure within that as well is your your role, as is my role. I work for an organisation um, that I can't embarrass that organisation mm -hmm. with the stories that I tell. And some of it is okay in terms of kind of the the historical context. So there is a series of uh, letters and newspaper articles where the local British Lace Federation was saying to the art school publicly what are you doing with all that stuff? We've heard this about it, we've heard you're mm. selling bits off, mm -hmm. um, we've heard um, that it's uh, water in a waterlogged room, we, you know, we're hearing all these stories, tell us what you're doing about it, and this is going out in the evening post. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's private letters going to the sort of then, then principal, um, and then there's m sort of memos of him saying, what are we doing with this lace off? You know, to the staff going, what yeah. are we doing? And we need to do this and we need to do that. And then you see it's sort of a year later, there's a newspaper article saying the School of Art and Design is doing um, this with its archive. Um, so all of that exists within, in, and yeah. you know, and I'm sure the things you're yeah. are much more scandalous <laughs> and exciting than all of that. But, um, you know, and it, it, it wouldn't matter to reveal that mm -hmm. now and talk about that. There could be some quite interesting conversations yeah. that we could have about sort of local history. But there are stories like that around the last 10 years as well that, mm -hmm. you know, I have to be very careful how I manage yeah. and how I experience. So, yeah, you are filtering and editing mm -hmm. information and, mm -hmm. and what you can say and what you yeah. can't say mm -hmm. um, because of, of who you might wound or, or yeah. cause mm -hmm. problems for. And so some of those might be about a directive, but it also might be about a kind of you knowing already what the institution yeah, would stomach yeah, or which yeah, is a kind of yeah. internalization. I, I think about this a lot, you know, of this kind of what does becoming institutionalized mean? And I think part mm. of it is that second guessing of what might fly and what mm. might not yeah. fly. So the, you know, the point where I got involved with the archive mm. was a point where um, it was all of that, the archive that is in that room was in cupboard under the stairs. Mm. And I do share this with some people who come into the archive and talk to them about it, but I wouldn't be public, public mm -hmm. about it. Um, it was in covered under the stairs. We were moving buildings. So somebody opened this cupboard and said, oh my God, what's all of this? And took it out, told the dean, there's all this stuff, I think this is what they used to call the lace archive sort of thing. And so the dean's response was, well, you put it on eBay and then whatever doesn't sell <laughs> goes in a skip. We're moving yeah. buildings, we've got to get it out. What are we mm -hmm. going to do with it? Who wants it? We don't teach lace mm -hmm. design. Da, 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 da. Um, and, you know, you can understand there's a certain rationale around all mm -hmm. that. You know, um, luckily, somebody else said, actually, we can. I think we can do something with that. And that was, that was yeah. the point where somebody said, Amanda, can you help me do something? And we, we got a little bit of money... Um, from a research council to then start and get things in motion. Mm -hmm. So we could, I could have not been here, couldn't I? You know, there could yeah. have been a whole other history to that. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, there are members of the, the local, the remains of the lace industry who are adamant there are there were things sold off from the archive. Mm -hmm. And as 
as we talked about with one of the pieces that Linda's using in the exhibition, we, um, the, we think from what we've seen written that there was a beautiful drawing of something we've only now got a photograph of mm. that was on a principal's wall which has gone, I've, you mm-hmm. know, I've never heard yeah. mention of. This is this remarkable piece of a kind of uh, dance macabre of mm. these skeletons a by, a, by, a, by yeah. a guy named William Hallam With Pegg, who studied right. there in the 1880s, yeah. 1890s, yeah. committed communist who made a series of basically kind of like Marxist lace designs, mm. right? And one is this kind of fantasia of the aftermath of like the economic conference in the early 30s with these mm. like skeletons and hammer and sickles kind of dancing yeah. in this composite city mm. and it's kind of yeah I mean it's a fascinating thing in that archive because mm. it's like wow how would mm. how would this have been stomached but mm. yeah it's great mm. to hear that vice principal or someone had it in their office or yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah but it's long gone and yeah you know but it might turn up somewhere That's at it. some point yeah. car boot yeah. somewhere or mm. Yeah. I think the thing I was going to say a little bit earlier mm. as well, and I, I don't know whether at Chatsworth you had this or at her, or that, I'm happy, I have to turn a lot of things away. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, you know, I, I get offered things that, I mean, a lot of wedding dresses I get offered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and With all the big stories behind yeah, them, I should think, yeah, as well, probably. Yeah. But lots of offers of, we're clearing out this, we're clearing out that, right. we've found this, we've found that. And... I mean, one, I have a really restricted space, so I try mm. not to sort of in, engage with it. And when you were talking about um, earlier, uh, we've, we've had stuff from Nottingham Castle collection. Mm-hmm. So a lot of things actually hadn't been accessioned in, in the collection mm-hmm. before it got taken apart and taken out of the, the buildings that it was in in Nottingham, um, before it went out to Newstead via, via the castle over a... I don't know, that happened over about five or six years, mm. I think. Um, so we have had some things that have been deaccessioned from mm-hmm. there or not ever accessioned, mm-hmm. that when they got things out, thinking about the space they had, it was like, do we really need this? Is this adding any more to our story mm. of what we want to say, you know, what we want to preserve and what we want to say about the heritage of, of Nottingham in lace terms? So I'm kind of... I have to ask very serious questions whenever anyone offers me anything. I mean, I, not really if somebody rings up again with a wedding dress from 1975. <laughs> um, but, you know, but yes, there are sometimes things you sort of piques your interest and you yeah. think that could be interesting. But I do try not to add to it, really, because yeah. actually I like the idea that it... And I don't, I don't want to preserve it in Aspic at all. It's a collection in an art school and it needs to be used and it should be used. And, um, you know, and that's the kind of approach and that I want to take to it but I do like the fact that it is a random collection Mm -hmm. that nobody went Mm -hmm. out specifically looking for anything Mm -hmm. so it tells a story of a particular period with a particular industry in a particular region Um, and you know and I like that Mm. fact Mm. about it really. I went to when I was um, in Germany last week I was there partly to do research trips about the Bauhaus because we're working mm. on something related to the Bauhaus next year. It's the centenary of it being founded in mm. 1919. And I went to Dessau, which is an hour and a half outside of Berlin. Mm. And it's where the Bauhaus was for between about 1925 and 1930. In this incredible building designed by Walter Gropius, mm. like the founding director of the Bauhaus. And it, so it moved from Weimar to Dessau and he got the budget to make this building and it's I mean, it's remarkable and it's incredibly well preserved so it feels like you're just getting out of the train and turning up into like 1926 and it's still oh, yeah. a functioning <laughs> school and I'd never been quite sure how it survived um, mm-hmm. and I found out a bit more and so it was closed down under political pressure from the Nazis in 1930, 31 they wanted to demolish it then because this kind that. of like you know it's this you know, incredible uh, icon of international modernism and they didn't get round to it because they actually found it was very practical to use as like hospital like training college and so on mm. so there are these archive photos when with the Bauhaus kind of typeface you know the kind of famous Herbert Bayer font mm. taken down and replaced by Nazi in, insignia and so then the kind of war comes and they don't get to demolishing it the whole of the Dessau is flattened but somehow the school 
survives. Mm -hmm. And so again, it kind of then lurches into like GDR era and it's still being used as a like gymnasium, like sports hall, all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the kind of the history of it as this progressive art and design college is basically forgotten about. And it wasn't until the late 70s they started to think, you know, locally, you know what, we should do something about yeah. this. And so they put a call out to all of the people still living in Dessau, I guess also Berlin, Leipzig, any personal collections they might have related to the Bauhaus to kind of bring it back together again. Some of, I guess at this point in the late 20s, a number of the tutors were still alive, even though they were kind of dispersed. So almost in the manner of this com a community collection, but one that was dispersed very internationally, they started to assemble a collection, an archive. But then it wasn't until the fall of the wall that and then in the early right. 90s that they actually founded it as the Bauhaus Foundation. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of fascinating thing of a belated recollection of a thing for like 50 mm -hmm. years yeah. after the fact that a, and a growing sense that it's kind of important. Whereas if you c contrast that with what the kind of the other afterlives of the Bauhauses that open in Weimar yeah. and, and Berlin, but also Chicago, they kind of knew from the get-go that it was important and they were keeping stuff. So this, the biggest... Mm -hmm collection is still in Berlin even though the Bauhaus was only open there for two semesters or something mm. um, so it was this and seeing seeing this archive of photos of the building in different states of mm. disrepair amazing, or, it? yeah yeah it was it was kind of fascinating to see mm. quite an unusual archival history and as a result they still think of themselves as a kind of primarily an educational foundation whereas the others think of themselves as more of like holding these design and architecture kind of objects and mm -hmm. you know the pr products of the mm -hmm. school rather than the school itself yeah. I guess is kind of yeah. how it yeah. thinks of itself as an archive. Yeah. But it's interesting mm. just the, the quality of the architecture that it made it flexible that mm. it could have all these different uses and so probably mm. the fact that it was so excellent in this, in this design even though that's what, what the Nazis were scared of and wanted to get rid yeah, of yeah, it, yeah. it actually kind of went beyond that and that's why it's still around now I because Absolutely. Saved it, you know? Yeah, and what, what you kind of realise as soon as you step into this place is that it is the curriculum made like into a building. Yeah. It's kind of there. You walk into this mm. kind of lobby. Of course, there are no entrances or exits. Yeah. It's all like completely, you know, just like flatly yeah. hierarchical. And there's this Maholi Naj design space you walk into. And on the floor in the tiling is this almost constructivist diagram of the whole building of like, the auditorium connects to the canteen, connects well, to the workshops, yeah, yeah. connects <laughs> to the sleeping spaces. And it's really, yeah, it's like, it is the curriculum. It is mm. a diagram of what a school could be like. And as you say, well, yeah, it kind of functions then as many different things besides. And but it's, it's amazing when things like that become not more than itself and of itself. I mean, it's, it's a bit like you know, the Rennie McIntosh, you know, the Glasgow School of Art. Mm. I remember mm. going up there when I was on that. 18, 19, at one point I started thinking of going either there or, or down here in Nottingham. I remember kind of going in, in there and sort of seeing all, all the details and it wasn't just the building which you know, of its type, it's really, really impressive. You go on the toilets, you know, and all the soap tissues and the toilet mm -hmm. hole, holds, all designed by him, all the mm -hmm. easels, that level yeah. of kind of detail. Mm -hmm. so just walking into this whole kind of world, you know, yeah. so in a way it was like, a, it's like living history and it was, it was an incredible thing. So this mm -hmm. is almost like, you know, a century later, this kind of art school kids mm. were making paintings, but it still kind of worked and sort of yeah, functioned, yeah. You know, yeah. which is an amazing it's been thing. really immersive, isn't it? Yeah, it's fun, yeah. yeah. Incredible, yeah. incredible. Also, also in Dessau, maybe kind of connected to what we've been talking about, there's also some of the houses that the masters lived in. So you can just go and it's like, all designed by Gropius. And so there's the house that Kandinsky shared with Paul Clay, you know, which I think it's, it's, kind of <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, next to like Oscar Schlemmer and da da da, but two were two were, were bombs, and one was Gropius's and one was Maholi Naj's, and they've argued for decades about what to do because the the kind of uh, the base of the house existed and they had extensive designs, but they didn't know what to do with them. So they ran three architecture competitions, and then each time I think they were like, actually, this isn't doesn't feel right. In the end, what, what finally got built a couple of years ago by this young, I think, Berlin-based practice was if you imagine almost like a Rachel White Reed, mm -hmm. a kind of mm -hmm. ghost of these houses. So they're still functioning. The volumes are all still the same, but it's just made in kind of concrete, like the bunker that mm -hmm. we're in now, completely featureless. So the, deta the windows are all still there, but none of the details are there. Okay. And you walk inside and you're in a kind of shell of a building. 
And it's almost disappointing coming inside. You almost want it to be this completely inaccessible block of concrete. Mm. But it's like it does something quite um, potent in terms of invoking. It almost feels like an exorcism, mm. you know, invoking this like ghost house mm. that's no longer mm. this like beautiful like, atelier or, or whatever. Mm. So just you see them on this like leafy, quite kind of bougie suburban streets. You have these like the three chalets from the twenties with this like mm. big block, brutalist block. Yes, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, kind of connecting with what an archive is or isn't and how it could be kind mm. of unreliable. This is almost like a kind of self-consciously unreliable mm. take on that yeah. of like, we couldn't, how could you? Mm. Yeah, you can't. And the thing is, and, and the other thing, you know, just sort of, um, you know, sort of even going on from that as well is the fact that we're looking at, um, at archives from our own perspective as mm -hmm. well, aren't we? So, I mean, they're echoes of a time that's gone before, mm -hmm. but also you know, the whole work that Foucault was doing about epistemes, you know, this this sense that, you know, it's about you are not in the same mindset mm -hmm. as the mm -hmm. people that were living and creating mm -hmm. those objects and those spaces mm -hmm. and those documents as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've you're aware of what's happened since then as well, which colours, you know, and so, so you can't so we are we are a step away, we are divorced. There is some sort of veil mm. always there that we're not seeing them in exactly the Mm -hmm. the, the same the same way as they were appreciated yeah, yeah. then. No, I think it's really interesting. And, and again, you sort of think, especially maybe what's happening now, just in, 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 in things like yesterday's thing, the paper yesterday, I think it's in, in the, uh, the main galleries in Glasgow, they're taking out one of the paintings and stuff because it's like politically a bit insensitive, sexist, like that. Mm. and it, so it's, it's kind of sort of thinking the whole history of the last 20, 50, 100 years in terms of what was acceptable to be put on on a, on a gallery sort of space, and mm -hmm. which might, we might sort of say, well, actually, that's sexist, that's racist. There's all these sort of things. Do, in time, over the next sort of 50 years, do they get those paintings? Do they not get shown? Do they get put in the archives? And, mm -hmm. But as a as a record and as a testament, actually, what you know, I'll say for example, what the UK was like in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, where the, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a horrible history again, and mm -hmm. you know, so it's probably important that it's sort of still there. But maybe in terms of yeah. the curation. It's slightly embarrassing, so we don't put it there. We so we don't want that on the walls, and then that becomes mm. uh, so. Maybe in 100, 200 years' time, it's it's just. And again, it goes to that, that for me. And mm -hmm. she was sort of saying, be, mm -hmm. saying before, it's like you know what 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 was actually on the walls, and what did people, mm. how, how what was on the walls then, and what did that say about the society then, and how we look back on mm -hmm. how that society mm. at that time is very mm -hmm. different. Yeah, it's like you know, it's like taking taking down sculptures, which of course are on pedestals and plinths, yeah. so you're literally looking up to yeah. them. Yeah. But mm -hmm. in a sense of of people that have perpetrated, to our sensibilities, the most atrocious. Yeah, what's well, so like, well, like in America, I suppose all those, those <laughs> the moment, you know? taking down those statues from the south mm -hmm. and sort of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. there's all that thing well, kind of coming. Yeah, yeah. but what do you do? Yes. Seeing yes. Cecil yes. Rhodes yes. in Cecil Oxford, Rose. yeah, yeah. And, and Colston Hall in yeah. Bristol as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you are editing it, but then at the same time, mm -hmm. these are not figures that you revere, and the way that they are, the art, the statue is made is to be mm -hmm. revered and remembered mm -hmm. in a positive light. Mm -hmm. But actually, that idea is a bit like sort of, you know, just going like with the concentration camps, retaining those so that actually people, if you put it out of sight and out of mind, is it easy then for people to forget and deny things? But actually, if you keep them in the open, mm -hmm. is it sort of a, a potent reminder? I guess Germany's warning? been one of the exemplars of this, hasn't it? Of, yeah, like, of preserving and facing. Of not hiding the, the dark eye back yeah. to the underbelly, yeah. isn't it? And not ignoring and there's it. There's a lot of, lot of debates in Germany right now because they have been so um, uh, facing up to the 20th century that actually they've all. It's, Increasingly, the debate is turning towards well, actually what about German colonialism? What about the German mm. colonial project, which has mm. been kind of overlooked mm. because of the very understandable focus on the yeah. you know, 20th century? And so, yeah, these kinds of the status of these these monuments and what gets preserved, mm. I think, is it's really being called into question more than you know I can remember yeah. this last kind of year mm. or yeah. two. It's really but the conversation's gone somewhere totally different. And 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 and, and, and again, I suppose like kind of parallel like with that. I mean, I think what Maybe possibly I'm really speaking for us, but it, it's like when you sort of see, say, uh, the destruction of, you know, these incredible sites in Syria, you know, mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. ISIS will kind of go and, yeah. Yeah. and it kind of, oh my God, it hurts oh, kind yeah. of watching it. You're, you're, you're wincing. wincing. It's, oh my, because it's gone, yeah. it's so yeah. finished. 
and then and, and obviously it's it's done to kind of create that that emotion mm. that kind mm-hmm. of anger and sort of stuff and, and and that's kind of gone for years I and mean, i think you know, the christians have been doing it all i think mm-hmm. every you know every uh, generation to, to, to a larger or lesser extent kind of does that but it isn't it's, it's kind of weird to sort of think especially in the west we're sitting in this kind of gallery you know to be sort of thinking well that is something that you could consciously do is just destroy something which exists for two three mm-hmm. thousand four thousand mm-hmm. you would just never do it you just sort of think it's mm-hmm. it is like sacrosanct and, yeah. sort of, mm-hmm. and uh yeah but then it's just everything's kind of rubble isn't it it's mm-hmm. It makes me think about mm. sort of, it's making me jump to sort of back to about sort of deaccessioning as well and also what you were saying before about you don't know what future generation is going to be interested in mm-hmm. as well and what's going to evolve and you're saying about the oral archive, well in future what, what is that, you know, what is going to, what's going to move on from that as well and I think that's one of the difficulties with, with deaccessioning, I think it's also a fear mm-hmm. that actually you're destroying something that is, or, uh, well, not destroying or you're breaking apart something that, that people are going to look back on and take a judgment on because, of course, they're going to see it from their own perspective mm-hmm. rather than ours. And, and I think that's one thing working in heritage, you, you know, and particularly when you're sort of dealing with sort of CEOs and so on and, and, and you're thinking, but actually, we're here for one generation and actually there are generations before and there are generations to come. And there is, and I think that does change the decisions you make and the whole push with conservation, of course, you know, trying to make it reversible wherever possible mm-hmm. because techniques will change, better ways of conserving will sort of come in as well. So, but at the same time, I think you can't be entirely hamstrung yeah. by fear at the same time. So it's a really interesting And it shifts so quickly. I, I say, when the, when this, the Gamelda Gallery that I was in, they, they were showing two... Um, two Rembrandts from the collection of Joshua Reynolds who mm. extensively repainted them like three quarters of them and he from his diary says like, well I'm, I'm improving these because they were not the best Rembrandts and it's only been in the last few years that through x-rays they can work out what how much has been yeah. repainted and realizing what the kind of under, underlying kind of thing is but when I was looking at those, I was thinking, I mean, that's incredible that was happening yeah, yeah. then, and that would have been yeah. not only acceptable, he was like very, very confident yeah. that he was in dialogue with and helping out Rembrandt because these weren't yeah. his best works, versus, you know, a kind of supposedly, probably not really, kind of iconoclastic work by like the Chapman brothers in the 90s when they did those series of like yeah. scratching out Goya. Or Rauschenberg. Yeah. Or, yeah. Rauschenberg. Yeah. or Rauschenberg with de Kooning yeah. in the yeah. 50s. Yeah. Or, yeah, that these kinds of things that in the 20th century were kind of retooled as iconoclastic in, yeah. in some kinds of ways mm. was actually just kind of standard. It was part of the conversation. Yeah, yeah and I think things, things weren't sort of revered in the, in the same way necessarily mm-hmm. in the way that, you know, that, that you, you know we do. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about tapestries in collections that, that you know, um, as well, the fact that they would sort of be cut up and stuck together to fit a room as they mm-hmm. move from one room to another and things mm-hmm. like that. Whereas now, you know, we're sort of trying to preserve every <laughs> every original stitch, not even every original stitch, but the stitches of some of the treatments that have happened afterwards. Because mm-hmm. then that tells you about the evolution of the of the object and it's all part of the history and integrity so of the object So has that moved towards well. now this kind of acceptance that it's kind of palimpsestic? Yeah, and you shouldn't be kind of stripping back or, or no or... <sighs> What's the current thinking on that? I think it really diff- I think it really differs. I think there is that sense that you should re- you need to respect the layers of history, mm-hmm. which sort of brings us back to compost, doesn't mm-hmm. it, as well? Mm-hmm. But actually, but then I think it does come down. I think actually, in practicality, it comes down to sort of a case by case basis as well, mm-hmm. because I think if something, if there's been an intervention that actually stops you reading something in the way that it was intended, mm-hmm. then would you sort of record the later intervention but then take it away mm-hmm. in some mm-hmm. instances mm-hmm. because it actually you know, prevents the, the reading of it in the way that the mm-hmm. person that created it intended it to be mm-hmm. read. Mm-hmm. But it's a really interesting one about that, you mm-hmm. know, about you're talking about sort of the Rembrandts because who on earth is going to want to take away Joshua Reynolds' <laughs> yeah, right. work in order to get back to a right. Rembrandt, right. you know. Right. Um, so yeah. it's, it's a fascinating, it, I think it's one where curators love going round and round and round in circles about. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to, I, mean, I think we've, we've all kind of through, through what we do have these kinds of quite lived connections with the archives and I think of being able to articulate how some of the idea of an archive might correspond to some of these kinds of ideas of compost or composition or, or whatever. 
But there are these other kind of subcategories that we've been presented with here that for me anyway feel like they were, that connection is a little more hazy or a little more oblique. And I wanted to turn to this kind of question of artificial intelligence mm. um, and wondering like for you, maybe just to kind of start off thinking about that, how, how if at all, would you want to kind of connect, the, join the dots between some of these conversations between compost layers, time, AI? Does that make any sense for you? Might not at all. What's, what, uh, I mean, I mean it's, it seems like, like well, that's in, in a way I think potentially could be one of the biggest social, cultural, political shifts is this whole thing about AI. And I think we're only just on the kind of cusp of realising actually these things are start to affect us you know, just with sort of technology. And when did you first become aware of AI? When uh, do you? Because I remember when I, I did. I'll tell you. But, um, but when, when do you, do you well, recall? Well, well, pro well, probably through science fiction films. And, uh -huh. and it always probably sort of felt like it was something kind of over there. Mm. I suppose. Right. And so this is like HAL in Space Odyssey or yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, something like yeah. this. Yeah. So this is, yeah, in, yeah, in the 1970s kind of growing up. And I suppose that it was that, mm. yeah, this intelligent kind of robot and we kind of created mm. it and it became its own. So mm. it was, it's probably yeah. through those kind of, kind of films. But for a long time, it, it did feel in the kind of realms of kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 but, it, but it's almost I, th I think the whole kind of thing about technology how it's just getting sp not spiny it's it's going faster and faster and faster mm -hmm. almost this this kind of vortex and how we are so we choose to be so dependent on it. I mean, let me say for yeah. example like our phones. I mean, it's just like uh, if you forget your phone in the morning, you have a uh, it's a really weird feeling like you kind of disconnected from the from the world and mm -hmm. so it's how you see. The world is almost through the lens of your phone, more and more so. So mm -hmm. it's almost this kind of this push-pull thing that's incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you think, "Shit, am, am I? Is my whole experience of the world through this thing?" And then you mm -hmm. sort of think, "Okay, it's not part of me physically, but it's inside of me." And, mm -hmm. and what is the next step? Does it actually become inside mm -hmm. of you? And, and I think that transition yeah. is. But, but then there's this thing about what kind of that thing with acceptance and death and compost and, and, mm -hmm. and all those things that almost sort of seems what we perceive from from a from a human perspective that the, the natural order of things you know we're, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're we're flesh and bone and we'll, we'll kind of sort of die but somehow we're in, in control of this and we understand it but almost the way, as soon as you have this thing with kind of artificial intelligence mm -hmm. everything goes goes to shit then because mm -hmm. it, all that how we perceive the world, what is kind of important, what's not, what's not important. Everything is is, is different. Mm -hmm. Everything is completely mm -hmm. different, and so it is a. It's, I think we're on the cusp of something which is, obviously incredibly interesting, but kind of potentially terrifying. Mm -hmm. Terrifying it, why? I, th I think in in in. in in some ways, I think we, even though in our own kind of crazy ways, we sort of think we're we're in control, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mean that that terrifying, yeah. almost that kind of mm -hmm. that romantic terrifying. Whereas, whereas before, we used to maybe sort of see nature mm -hmm. as uh, we, we're in, uh, uh, I don't know that romantic sort of thing, the sublime, where we uh, nature was always more powerful than us, mm -hmm. and that's we had this kind of romantic vision of of of, of, uh, of the sublime mm. and then in a way we then try to kind of harness nature we sort of thought we're in control we're in control of it and uh but almost then through uh, us kind of harnessing it and that's kind of kind of come through technology we've almost mm. kind of sort of squeezed it and it's kind of popped out over there mm -hmm. where almost that this, this this other thing like like potentially you know could end, end up controlling us you know mm -hmm. and, and we sort of think with this the epicenter of the world and maybe we're not because i was I, thinking about this i realized the first time i had some awareness of ai i guess you i guess it was you would classify it as ai was when that computer program deep blue mm -hmm. i think it was called deep blue beat gary kasparov the oh, then chess yes. grandmaster yeah i think it must have happened in the early 90s yeah. mm -hmm. i remember mean, being pretty young yeah. and seeing it on tv and that was also a moment when actually chess was kind of televised, which seems quite <laughs> weird yeah. now. Quite but it was actually a big deal. Yeah, I can remember yeah. a number yeah. of names of chess players who were playing it. Yeah. Like, it must have made a comeback, actually. It would be a good fit with mindfulness, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. sort of, you know. but I, and I remember it was, it was a tremendous embarrassment for Casper. Mm. Yeah. And, it, was, and it, was, it prompted a lot of um, 
hand wringing, I suppose, and just like where is this going to go yeah. and so on. Mm. And I remember, and I wonder, I wondered, wonder, kind of think, why did it feel so distressing? And there was something about the sense of the computer, the interface then, because it looked like crap, right? Yeah. It was a kind of completely 2D, yeah. pixelated thing. And yet, and this you could do it, this. Yeah. Well, well, the tennis thing was just that, that, that's, Absolutely. That, that's as kind of sophisticated as it was in terms of games <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Then, so, like, it? graphically, it felt like super basic. Yeah. And I don't wonder if there was something somewhat sinister between this, like, very evident already gap between the intelligence underpinning this kind of interface and what, you know, how you could see it. Whereas, like, now, of course, that's been completely closed, yeah. that mm. kind of idea of an uncanny valley or yeah. whatever has been completely kind of shifted but that for me was like the first time I remember like mm. becoming cognizant of what AI was and it feels probably relevant that it was beating a man at a one of the oldest kind yeah. of games mm. known to man you yeah. know and so on it's like something yeah. kind of quite mythic about that I think defeat. it's about fun yeah. for me it's sort of it was about sort of vulnerability as you know as the whole human race in mm -hmm. the sense that you know sort of most of the, you know for those who are sort of you know when we've lived in cities and so mm -hmm. on I, I mean our only predators are ourselves mm -hmm. you know there yeah, is and yeah. you know it's not right. like sort of you know in prehistoric times when there were sort of dinosaurs or huge animals that were our predators you know we don't actually have any yeah. natural predators in most of our apart from other human beings in mm -hmm. our everyday life these days and this idea that actually you are slightly that you are invincible or convincing yourself that yeah. you're that you're invincible as a race and I there is that potential that actually you've created something that is actually going to wipe you out. Yeah, yeah. And actually, is that a bad thing when you see what we're doing to this planet, <laughs> frankly? Yeah. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, you think as you're going, what someone you said yeah. at the beginning, you know, and obviously, you know, very much and very much sort of present following your return from Alaska as well. I think what a mess that, you know, mm -hmm. that we sort of make of it. But that idea, it's a, I think it's about sort of, for me, I've always interpreted it as vulnerability, that sense that, that human beings aren't top of the tree mm -hmm. anymore, that mm -hmm. actually there's, a, there's somebody new in town mm -hmm. that could actually overtake mm -hmm. the human race. And, and it's the, a lot about fear. Yeah. And, and, and the things we've actually created. That, that, that's, and that's, we've created, we, yeah. created it's like Frankenstein's yeah. monster, yeah, isn't it? it? Or opening and Pandora's And I think it's kind thoughts. of no coincidence that like, this idea of that we're going to get wiped out by AI has really taken hold most acutely in Silicon Valley. Mm. So you've got all of these kind of venture capital mm. guys in, you know, around Palo Alto, yeah. really buying up patches of land in places like Alaska, yeah. all yeah. kinds of islands to kind of say when all of this falls apart yeah. because of what we have kind of wrought, then we're all getting out of yeah. it. And yeah. they've got, and they've got food, their communities it's the kind of ready classic to kind of Cold War yeah. imagination yeah. of like what surviving looks like, which is like, why would you actually want to live yeah. in this like, yeah. world? In, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know it's about like surviving a nuclear explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you want to survive? Because everything you loved and yeah. held dear would be gone. But then actually, as human beings, that is our strongest instinct, isn't it? Survival. Yeah. But our conversation about archives tended to be somewhat kind of backward looking. I think we were trying to pull out how archives are also in the present tense and are always also evolving or degrading and so on. But I guess with AI, we maybe we're not far enough in to trace any kind of history of AI, mm. but we're already, you start to look to the future, right? As soon as you kind of, and I realize like looking at this term, I barely know what it means, like yeah. what the, all the, yes. what the implications yeah. are. I know, I, so I think that was probably the term that I struggled most with in terms of mm -hmm. thinking about trying to bend my mm. head around that mm -hmm. actually and how that and how that added up but I think I think just say, talking about vulnerability makes me think about archives as well it is because we are so transient you know, that actually having an archive that carries on is reassuring mm -hmm. as well what do you think about to push on that like kind of this idea of what does the artificial in artificial intelligence mean and what might that kind of bring to bear on what we when we were talking about can archives lie, can they mm. mislead? What would an archive as a kind of form of artificial intelligence look like? <laughs> I think is what I'm asking. Oh, oh, now you're stretching my brain. I'm not sure I've got an answer for this one right now. <laughs> yeah. But what does artificial intelligence, I mean, as a term, taking it aside from what it kind of denotes now, I mean, what, does it, what is artificial intelligence? We started out by talking about author authenticity, didn't yeah. we? Yeah, but, but, but in a way, I, I think it's, it's almost... To, to me, it's almost it's it's creating another 
being it's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's creating something which we're not in control of you know mm -hmm. so, so, so to me it's, so you sort of think it's, it's artificial. non-human it's, it's not human mm -hmm. but but it is but it is because mm. as soon as you say it's, it's artificial you sort of think it's not real but it is real in, mm -hmm. in, in its in itself and, it, and it's almost you can almost see it potentially i mean that's that sort of thing uh, does artificial have uh, emotions or feelings or it, it's, it's mm -hmm. those sort of things what are feelings what are emotions mm -hmm. and I suppose going back into some of the words which are presented here that that, ana that whole thing about animism that, that somehow everything has its own uh, spirit okay mm -hmm. if, 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 if there's an art if there's a robot which is artificially intelligent mm -hmm. does that robot have its own sense of it of itself mm -hmm. or does it uh, does it feel you know is, is there an essence of of, of, of that and it's really telling right that we the words we immediately grasp for are words like Frankenstein Frankenstein's yeah. mm -hmm. monster mm -hmm. yeah. and why is our it's frame threatening. of reference limited to this like gothic mm -hmm. novella written at, yeah, yeah. around the industrial yeah. revolution by an 18 year old woman yeah. but it was like narrated as the story goes on the edge mm -hmm. of a lake telling ghost stories yeah. with Byron and yeah. whoever else but that's still there's something so all of the kind of things that we've articulated about what the challenges it's that AI it's presents, it's, it's, it's kind of there of the and it's at the dawn of in industrialization. Yeah. Yeah. But it's that fear of the unknown, I think it's, yeah. it comes back to somehow we, st especially the, you know, the beginning part of the 21st century, we still have this idea that somehow we're in control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think it's like you sort of said. It's like learning that we're not. They were learning that we're not and kind of, kind of letting go in a way. Mm -hmm. and, th and I think that's, that's the really difficult and, and challenging sort of thing. Maybe on the 50s and sort of 60s, we had sort of technology, we could do this, we have nuclear bombs, it'll all be kind of mm. possible. We've kind of got to the point now where it's so, and it does kind of feel we're kind of coming to some crossroads, I think, you know, environmentally, culturally, politically, all these, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. Things do feel very fluid and, and, and unstable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the things about, you know, technology, artificial, it's, it's one sort of thing which, we, which it's a double-sided sword. We love it, but we hate it. You know, mm -hmm. we, you know, it's like a knife. You can cut with mm -hmm. it, but you can kill with it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's it's only a tool. But it's almost like this this knife has its own. It can do what it wants. You, you're not you're not control yeah. of the knife anymore mm -hmm. because much this knife can do what it wants. Mm -hmm. does, I think that's the fear. Does it make? I wonder if it also makes us question ourselves as well because you know I think we place a lot of importance on feeling and that being authentic and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, but actually, obviously, you know, you'll have scientists who will argue that love you yeah, know is literally point. just yeah. the cocktails in your yeah. brain mm -hmm. and actually it's just how your brain communicates and how that affects your brain so we sort of talk about the heart but you know and science the spirit, say, and the, uh, and the yeah, spirit yeah. but mm -hmm. actually it's no more than chemicals mm -hmm. and so artificial intelligence is just a mechanical yeah. version of that mm -hmm. in a sense and that's really yeah. unnerving yeah. because everything that we think makes us us and, and our unique. individuals and unique is mm. actually just, you know, a chemical, a chemical occurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and our language kind of changes with Sorry. that because it kind of, um, I was just thinking back, we were talking about stars earlier, stargazing. And in the 17th, 18th centuries, you would have talked about star-crossed lovers, right? Mm -hmm. Or kind of star-crossed destiny. Now you talk about people having chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. that our kind of language does mm. reflect these kinds of yeah. shifts but yeah. there's a slowness to it that we still yeah. talk about head and heart yeah. kind of split whereas I think we kind of know that yeah. isn't really there yes. but there's a lag in terms of how we think of ourselves as how we are in the world yeah. and then also kind of yeah. what knowledge we might have access to and, about, and I think there's, there's a thing in, in there, you know, about algorithms and, mm. and, and, and I think that kind of plays into this in, in terms of how we engage with the world I think with things like I mean say for example uh, like Spotify, and I don't know whether whether you use it, and, uh, and I use that, and I still buy vinyl, but it's uh, so sometimes like in, in the sort of studio, you know, you, you collate all your the kind of sort of things that you like, and you do playlists, mm. and then it has this daily mix, and then it mm. starts playing these sort of things, and yeah. the frightening thing is probably 95% of that stuff is, well, actually, that's really good, that's interesting, yeah. I like it. Mm. And then when I was a kid, you used to sort of think, I'm in complete control of uh, what I like, what I don't like, it's me, I'm a unique, I'm an individual. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of seeing these algorithms are actually kind of working out very fairly accurately what it is that you're about, mm -hmm. what you mm -hmm. like, what you might not like. That's kind of it's fan it's fantastic, but at the same time really frightening and a bit freaky because mm -hmm. this whole sort of sense mm -hmm. that you are making personal decisions, well maybe you're not. It's mm -hmm. you just you, your body's doing this, your heart yeah. wide, and it, it goes back to what you were saying about this idea of feelings and the spirit and this sort of stuff. You know, uh, is is it something? 
otherworldly? Is it something mm. you know spiritual is it something beyond, beyond or, the or, flesh and bone, or, or is it not mm. at all? It's, it's just synapses and kind of things yeah. we're just kind of hardwired, mm. and, mm-hmm. and we're not ready to accept that yet. And oh, also, no. when you do, what does that? Where does that leave you? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. I suppose in mm-hmm. a sense. But I think the algorithms. I think is really is a really key issue, isn't it? As well, because the fact you are fed what you believe agree with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So although you know, sort of the you know the web and the digital age yeah. has opened up our world yeah. in it's every possible at the same way. Time. At the same time, it's done that. So mm. you will you will be fed the things that you agree with rather than anything that's challenging. And wasn't there was there a dean? That was that was speaking about about free speech or something, and the fact that you know about having controversial figures in that, you know that actually it was important because it is important to learn mm-hmm. to be challenged, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and actually and to be you know and and actually that 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 takes your thinking on as mm-hmm. well. Whereas if mm-hmm. you're constantly talking with like-minded people, and actually you've seen you know Trump, Brexit, and everything, yeah. you know I mean I thought the world had gone. A long way, mm-hmm. and then actually, you suddenly realise that people like me yeah. thought it had mm-hmm. gone a long way, but for the majority of people, actually, they were really. There was off. In, yeah. in the yeah. the snap general election last year. I read that afterwards the news items that had been most shared and liked by Labour voting Facebook users were on uh, fox hunting and the ivory trade. And like now, whatever else you might see, the general election having been fought and mm-hmm. like lost yeah. on last year yeah. these That's were not the kind of key things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so there's clearly a disconnect yeah. between yeah. a kind of public political discourse and a kind of private mm. kind of social network kind of discourse mm. it's like really there's weakening the democratic process and i mean that's almost a slightly somewhat comic example of that yeah. and the kind of russian collusion mm. would yeah. be at the kind of more mm. nefarious end of things but yeah i mean clearly that's been a but it's also shift. you know the the channel four newsreader who a couple of weeks ago had a debate with an American academic who's quite Trump-like in his yeah. views about mm. women and language. Um, and she had a br- it was a brilliant debate to watch. And then Channel 4 News had to get security in. You know, I mean, this is just one story yeah. amongst mm. many mm. at the moment, yeah. isn't it? Um, because she's now being victim of all sorts of abuse of people. Right. And they're like, how dare you give this guy a hard time? And kind of fits into yeah, yeah. your kind of clothes. And mm. so, yeah, I think there are some really scary things that mm-hmm. are dystopian aren't they mm-hmm. in terms of our the use of technology but maybe 100 years ago those dystopian views were about disease mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we still have those as well you know we've had there's i mean it's been kept quite um sort of small news item but you know the flu and kind of you know mm-hmm. i keep picking up things about the 1980 yeah epidemic and how many millions it killed and mm. you know oh we've got a flu epidemic so you know disease is another one that, mm. and I kind of I, I suppose when you listen to scientists talking about disease like flu like yeah. viruses they do talk about it a little bit the way we're talking mm. about technology yeah. and mm. technology's threats mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. us I mean so I was, I was talking to this, uh, this uh, scientist researcher guy, uh, guy on that and he was saying that the biggest, and his, uh, his primary research is, is about, about diseases and diseases which affect humans. And he sort of said, it's not the internet, it's not all those sort of things, it's probably not like nuclear war, it's, it's going to be diseases which are going to probably mm-hmm. wipe out you know, a, a vast percentage of the world, if not in the next mm-hmm. five years, ten years, sort of twenty years. And he, sort of, and he sort of said, just of this sort of thing, with antibiotics, you know, they're, they're coming to the, uh, yeah. we, we, we overuse them so much they've just become mm-hmm. coming redundant. And it is the sort of thing which no one's kind of talking about, but really, in, in mm. terms of a threat to humanity, that's mm. probably a bigger threat is, mm. is, is disease and where it kind of mm. comes in so fast. And because we travel and communicate so quickly, how these diseases can spread so kind of quickly and mutate, probably more so than anything to do with artificial mm-hmm. in, in, intelligence. Mm-hmm. You know. mm-hmm. but, it's, but it's something which is maybe so raw and powerful and visceral. And I think in our arrogance as kind of the human race, we think, well, we've... We've got rid of this. We've got rid yeah. of this. We've even like AIDS, which we at one point in the eighties, it was the most terrifying thing. It mm. just sort of said that was just going to destroy everything and everybody. Yeah. You, know, you, saw, mm. you saw, you saw, no way out of it, and mm. it's kind of been contained. Obviously, it's still tragic for people involved, but in terms of how many people it's killing, it, it's it's it's, it's mm. less and less and less. It's and managed. It's managed. It's managed. Mm. And, uh, a difficult mm. way, but still managed. Yeah. In our privilege, context. In our privilege, yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and I had a kind of question connected to the context, I suppose, about about the future, it, 
was thinking about, I think it's a line, it's either Douglas Copeland or William Gibson said, I think it's Copeland said, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, so what I'm not entirely sure what it means. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good though. Well, that takes me straight in my head mm. to that, that documentary that I was talking about machines mm -hmm. and watching these people working um, in this mill in India and thinking that was Nottingham mm -hmm. 150, 60 yeah. Yeah. years ago. Yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, you know, having been to India quite a few times, that is my experience of being in that place is kind of looking at Blade Runner <laughs> and then I'm looking at Dickens, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, you just turn your head mm -hmm. and you have that kind of um, breadth of experience. And, um, you know, so I... Th I, I mm. think that that really is so a you, really accurate. But do you think then that the that means how has all of this affected the ways in which we imagine the future? You know, because if you kind of think back to fifties, sixties, kind of evocations of the future, Jetsons type yeah. things, right? It's just like shiny, mm. happy, kind of hoverboard. You know, or even kind of earlier to kind of arts and crafts movement. This kind of idea, of like, well, actually. It was full of promise, wasn't it? I think full of promise, yeah. 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 And now it's, with, mm. it's, it's it, it seems to have flipped. It's but it feels like we can't um, imagine very far now. I've been looking a lot in the archive of um, Alison and Peter Smithson, mm -hmm. the brutalist architects, and in the mid-50s they were commissioned to imagine a house of the future mm -hmm. uh, for an ideal home exhibition, which was in 1956. And their response to the commission was that you, they couldn't possibly, in 1956, imagine further ahead than 25 years into the future. So what they produced was this house imagining what yeah. life in 1981 would look like, but in some ways quite accurate, other mm. ways like yeah. outlandish. But looking at this, I was thinking, could no one would imagine life even 25 years in the future anymore, right? I mean... It's, no, it's, it's almost impossible. But it probably always is impossible. But the, mm. but, the, but the sense of it, and, and I kind of think even how, uh, like, like I don't know, to say, say for an example, like like there seems to have been these bigger waves and bigger movements and bigger, waves, and they just sort of seem to be getting getting closer and closer and kind of, sort mm -hmm. of smaller and smaller and, until it kind of comes this tiny little kind of whirl like this. Mm -hmm. and say even in terms of youth movements, say say for for an example like fashion or mm. for music and sort of these big ways and then you look at say well, I don't know, as, as, a, as a silly example but, but as an example from 1969 to 1976 you'd had everything from uh, from rock and roll hippie kind of culture uh, through through to punk rock and, and electronic, the electronic, electronic music, music electronic yeah. music and everything in between and in our imagination you sort of think that went on for Years for decades and decades. It happened like in less than ten years, you know, mm -hmm. and it, and everything just seems to be further and further and further and kind of compressed. So mm -hmm. sometimes, like, yeah, our, our imagination and our uh, ability to, to dream is, is, is becoming it's becoming less. It's, it's almost we're living out kind of I don't know ideas which were kind of written by sci-fi writers in the sort of seventies, fifties, six, sixties, mm -hmm. kind of before. But but I think in, in terms of Imagine even what's going to happen next year, two years, three years. I think even politically, you know, with Brexit, with Trump, mm. everything is it's it feels very short term. One year, two years, everything just feels like this. We can't mm. dream. Or in a hundred years' time, it's going to be fantastic. There's, there doesn't seem to be this vision of, a, even like post-war Britain, like at like the NHS, we're going to do this, which is which will take a long time to implement. But it's going to be fantastic for our society in 20, 30, 40, 50. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. big gestures don't seem to be around. It does seem to be more like closing in like this which mm -hmm. that's what it feels like yeah I feel like the kind of furthest ahead I hear people speculate and mostly it's around automation or mm. around self-driving cars yeah, yeah. you know it's like yeah. 2030 yeah. there'll be X number yeah. of whatever cars on the street and that's kind of it yeah. you know but yeah these like grand projects like the NHS yeah. or like an arts council yeah. or like whatever yeah, yeah. it might be those kinds of things big, these big generous anymore. gestures I think which change society mm. that, that seems to be lost a bit I think mm -hmm. you know uh, yeah, yeah everything just seems to be kind of mm -hmm. kind of kind of com coming coming to this point so I think it's a really important mm -hmm. turning mm -hmm. point and, and I suppose it goes back to that Anthropocene thing as well it's, mm -hmm. just, it's, it's kind of what we're doing now is just it's just massive you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I was reading uh 
the other day this series called something, it's called something like 95 theses on the internet and it's just this, this kind of technologist who's been developing these kinds of working propositions or provocations and one is that the only countries who get the internet are China, Russia and North Korea which I was like you immediately want to kind of think you know think back at that and say no I mean you know like it's this is not where the kind of major platforms have emanated from but then if you think about the last year or two mm. you'd have to say they are yeah. they are winning yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. on on so far as this goes yeah yeah gosh that's a that makes you think <laughs> I'll make a note of that one <laughs> how how might we go about connecting some of these dots of I mean or where do you see some of these questions of morphing archives mm -hmm. and cultural memory or cultural heritage or patrimony that mm -hmm. I think we started out by talking about? How do we kind of see the possibilities, the dangers when connected to AI, to algorithms, to like new, newly emerging digital platforms? I mean, are these things a challenge to the ways in which we conceive of archives? Or what happens next? I suppose, I suppose I'm mm. asking for some speculation about what's the, what are the possible futures of these morphing archives we've been talking about. I mean, at a very basic level, and I'm sure everybody would be able to take this much higher than me, <laughs> but is it about materiality in a sense? And there is, you know, and I mean, I think particularly when documentation, which obviously is a massive part now of sort of any mm -hmm. sort of collection as well, it was a sense of, well, particularly with the archives of the future, well, why would you keep the original piece of paper once you scanned it in? Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, and I can remember conversations around that sort of probably about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was that sense of, but then, it, but, and that's the danger for me, is what Wolfgang was saying about the way that technology is going so fast that actually you've lost something mm. tangible mm -hmm. and that it may not be readable in two or three years' time. I mean, I've got lectures that I gave when I was at the Wallace Collection on floppy disks. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, ne yeah. I'm never going to be able remember to... Remember them, yeah. You know, yeah, you remember those? And when I moved recently, I, I chucked them all out because I thought, yeah. well, I'm never going to... I mean, I'm... Well, even, see, even CDs are going now, so mm -hmm. you, you sort of thought they'd be there, mm -hmm. there, there mm -hmm. forever. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. exactly. And maybe it's just because I am somebody that, that you know, that loves objects. Maybe, I, you know, it's probably my, my bias and my mm -hmm. nervousness. But I do, but I, I do think... It, it does it does sort of concern me, sort of with everything being much more sort of digital mm -hmm. and transient. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, what is going to be left mm -hmm. in a hundred years' mm -hmm. time from mm -hmm. our generation? Yeah. So there's something about the kind of the continuity that archives can usually, you know, promise. Yeah. I suppose the promise of an archive is yeah. some kind of fidelity or, or continuity, yeah. whereas as we said earlier, reflecting on the uh, the devices that we're surrounded by now, these are all things that are just going to be completely yeah. incompatible. In. And also, you know, sort of the idea that you have Snapchat and it disappears after mm -hmm. well, yeah. many seconds yeah. or minutes or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it is so much more ephemeral now, isn't it, mm. as, as, as well, whereas I suppose, you know, before you you could you know, you could sort of have your newspaper and it's, you know, and it was on a microfiche yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. and you go through the yeah. machine and you yeah. can find the old report. Yeah. I don't know, so maybe it's all being saved somewhere in some huge server under the ocean that we're just yeah. not aware of. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I guess the kind of a positive side could be is, is generally how the, the size of archives, how that might be affected that, you know, I think in your archive, um, Amanda, it's however many thousand kinds of items and you're kind of limited by the size mm. of the space you have and mm. by the resources there. You know, and, and absolutely, you know, because it's not something that's publicly owned, um, mm. you know, it's at the whim of mm. another mm. another dean who might come along in the future and say, why have we got that? Mm. Get rid of it. Or, mm -hmm. you know, there are, I mean, from time to time there are conversations about things in Nottingham joining together and mm -hmm. it being taken out of the art school. So. There's all sorts of things that risk it. I, I 
kind of think there's something very comforting about archives, but I do think that's a generational thing. Mm. Mm. So, you, you know, you, yeah. it's that material culture, isn't yes. it? And yeah, I, you know, I, ca- I mean, I have made a shift with computes in my head, but there was a time, quite a long time, where I still had to have the piece of paper. Mm. I know, still have to print to off paper. those things on, yeah. you know, the bottom saying, do not print this out. Mm. This yeah. Um, but this materiality is really comforting, yeah. and which is something solid about that. Isn't yeah, it? I mean, Wolf, you mentioned like music formats, mm. and something that's been reported on a lot is that not only are people streaming more and more mm. from Spotify mm. or whatever, but people vinyl is selling better now, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, sure. year mm. on year than it has yeah. for decades. Mm. Cassettes as yeah. well, mm. and so I think on the one hand, things get more dematerialized, yeah. and on the other hand, people get kind of more attached of, of young generations yeah, too yeah. get attached to the material so I wonder if like archives might just become hybrid it's not just that they'll all disappear into the cloud but actually they might become more complex organisms where we rethink this relationship between the matter mm. of them and what's somehow circling around them in the ether mm. and, uh, and but I think mm. also also the, the, the potential of them I think and that's, that's the sort of thing I think something when you when you sort of think of an archive you see you see or someone's like Historical, it's in the past. It's almost kind of looking back, and and I think because it has, you know, uh, great examples of you know, design and art and what, literature, what, whatever, it, whatever it is, it's almost you know the, the, the idea that there's a piece of art in it, and that an art is it, it goes back a little bit to what we we're talking about before about some kind of hope and something of, of possibility, and I think that's the sort of thing with with art. It can make mm. you think, and that's the sort of thing it can make you change the way you believe or feel. And I think that's one of the most amazing things that art can do. And maybe that's one of the things which can make us dream for the next century. Mm. Is, is that's why art, I think, is probably more important now than, than, it, than it's ever been, because it can allow you to think more than the next year, two years, five, sort of ten mm-hmm. years. It can mm-hmm. allow you to dream, you know. And I think that's maybe something like, like with archives. You can kind of go mm. in into in, uh, it, that's a gallery, an archive, or, or you know, mm. a, an old historic house, and you can see one thing. And it can transport you, and it can make you just feel so absolutely amazing. And it's, it makes you sort of think it's it makes you think about the future, not so much about mm-hmm. the past, because you think I can, wow, they did that then, and that maybe sort of, and you maybe you're looking for a way of trying to resolve something. He goes, oh shit, that this or mm-hmm. inspires you to do mm-hmm. that. Yeah. So I think the really positive sort of generators for the for the future, they're, mm. they're, 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 they're alive things, aren't they? They're not just mm. a, a historical thing. Absolutely but the flip alive. the flip yeah. side to that, though, I think, is that they can also they. Be- can become too much of a weight as yeah. well. I'm thinking mm. specifically probably around artists now that something I've noticed a lot is that if you read artist statements today and compare them with artist statements of 50 years ago, artists today tend to say, I'm researching mm. this or I'm interested in this. To which you might say, like, I don't care. You know, mm-hmm. what are you making? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but artists in the 60s, probably through to the 70s and probably not the 80s, would have had no problem with saying, I am inspired by. Mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. inspired by the work of this artist yeah. and making work in response to or whatever. Now I feel like there's been such a thorough archival turn mm-hmm. or tendency that many artists, and this is maybe quite a kind of limited, you know, circles, have adopted the kind of language of the curator, the researcher, mm-hmm. the archivist, yeah, yeah, yeah. by yeah. it's and it's like it's so thoroughly mm. embedded. And it's like these are these people are not for the most part researching no. in any kind of like uh, you know no. p- proper sense. way, like real yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's like it, usually to be very cynical, it means like having kind of scanned Wikipedia for like half an hour or something. Well, that's <laughs> that's kind of yeah. and yeah. that the same kind of goes for most contemporary curators mm. that you're generalists mm. yeah, I feel this you know I'm yeah. kind of any exhibition I might make even <laughs> if it's kind of two years of most of my time focused on it it's still a very broad sway there's something that whole you know hundreds of people have spent mm. lifetimes working on a kind of small mm. pocket of it mm. and I think there is something about talking about the field of cultural production here a kind of reliance on the archive right now which mm. Well, yeah, you can argue it's freeing to a degree mm. in that like, they're, they're much more accessible than they once were, but I think it's also, I wonder about how it might limit music making, mm. Mm. art making, that kind of constant awareness. So my, my youngest... Constant awareness of the past. Of the past, yeah. It can yeah. come like a way. My, yeah. Yeah. my yeah. youngest brother, yeah. and this is getting quite nostalgic, but my young, young brother, who's in his early 20s, I remember kind of saying to him once, 
first I remember saying, oh, have you, what albums are you listening to? And answered some years ago, and he kind of laughed and said, albums? <laughs> <laughs> and, but then also what I, I remember when I was, you know, a music obsessed teenager, trying to defi- find, you know, obscure Detroit techno mm. or Krautrock mm. records from Japan or whatever. And it would take months it was or the search. even it was the years. Search. It yes. was a search and it was a mail order yeah. and it was yeah. understanding yeah. how record labels were, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. For my brother, he never had that because he, I could be talking to him about Detroit techno. Mm. The next time I'd see him, he would have listened to every Detroit techno yeah. record made between yeah. like 81 and 89 yeah. because he could. Yeah. And so there's a kind of fantastic facility or fluency with these kinds of archives or whatever you would, you would want to call them now mm. that I think, yeah, it's going to really shift I the terms of production. I just wonder sort of thinking also about, you know, sort of how much about experiencing something. Mm. And obviously, you've you know, talked for years about things, about artworks being immersive, being experiences, rather than sort of just, you know, something, mm. something on a wall. And I'm just sort of wondering about archives of the future. Is it going to be, is it actually going to be about something, you know, about just, just cameras, just sort of filming, mm-hmm. you know, daily life or mm-hmm. big events or something like that. So, but, so it's almost, it, but in a way that somebody you know with sort of VR is, is sort of almost immersed back into it mm-hmm. so you are getting the sounds the smells somehow you know sort mm-hmm. of the, almost feeling the texture of something that you're huh. actually in it rather than looking at it from that's your time and so I'm just an wondering archive. an archive that's more experiential it's like less of a that's immersive more of a verb right or how yeah. a kind of archive yes. could be mm. continually aggregating yeah. recording documenting yes and it's mm. about you looking around and you know, maybe you are sort of hearing <coughs> or seeing clues mm-hmm. rather than it being sort of a clue in an account book that tells you when a painting was, yeah. mm-hmm. was you know, and, and, but you're actually, you're actually experiencing it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as if you were there at the time rather mm. than, you know, and being a part of it rather than sort of looking through that, that mm-hmm. veil maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe that's a way that mm. technology will affect how we save information in the future and i think for that kind of point of uneven distribution the likelihood is that any rethinkings of the archive in the coming decade they're not going to be coming from public institutions right Mm. or individual collections these are going to be like corporate projects you know the way that google for a kind of Mm. fun can just archive the world you know (laughs) in like maps or street view or or whatever and in a way that's was not necessarily a business model. It was just a, like, we've got a lot. We can do that. We can, we we can, can do, do that, yeah. and we might be able to create a business of it once we've got all this information. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I think this kind of privatizing of knowledge, I suppose, is something that we're going to be kind of coming up against more and more for how these kinds of, mm-hmm. they're taking on the roles of, or moving into some of the territory that we've traditionally in the West thought to be the, the kind of um, terrain of, Institutions, public institutions. Yeah, it's interesting. We're accountable. I'm just thinking about the currency then. It's of currency archives. and privilege, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, a lot of the world haven't collected um, stuff in the way that we have, mm-hmm. you know, so, um, you know, either the kind of non industrial parts of the world and or the areas of the world where actually they've had to prioritise, you know, what they spend. Um, in, in other directions. So it says something about our privilege and wealth, doesn't it, that we've got mm-hmm. these archives and that we can mm-hmm. make these statements about our culture. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. Uh, but is, is, is mm-hmm. it something that goes back to what you said before, but Sam, as well, you know, but is, is, it, you know, is it the search for the collection? Does, does that search, to, and, and the, does the more, the more difficult search, does, does it make the collection more worthy, like, like, like a record collection, say, mm-hmm. for example? Mm-hmm. If you're going around, need, yeah. It? If you're if you're going around loads of kind of like crate boxes, like looking things, trying to find these things 20, 30, 40 years ago, and you find yeah. it, does that then experience become so much more powerful because the journey mm. you've got from mm-hmm. there to there it becomes part of the uh, the exploration? Whereas now, like I don't know, you can like I said about your brother, you can change your complete record collection within a couple of hours. You mm-hmm. can, you can change <laughs> how you dress by going on Amazon and just ordering a complete new wardrobe and dress exactly like a completely new different person 24 in 24 later, hours yeah. later mm-hmm. whereas you know 10 20 years ago it was a search it was a, it was a yeah. and maybe when you make these kind of connections mm-hmm. together maybe it's more powerful maybe you think things sort of through rather than 
we can accumulate all this yeah. kind of sort of stuff. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. But is is it just like wallpaper? You know, how, how much how, how much depth how does much it depth have? does it have? You know, you have all this yeah. stuff and it and all the the dots that sort of join. But behind that, what does it feel? What does it mean? You know, what what is it? Why is it resonant? Why is it not resonant? And it is about that. I always remember feeling that about about travelling when I was sort of younger. You know, getting on a plane in London and then ending up in Bangkok, yeah. and then you know, and it'd been a few hours, and I just I knew, and I got there, and I can remember going. I'm in Bangkok. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. whoa. It was like a thrill, <laughs> you know? wasn't it? it was and like it was just like, oh, you know, we're yeah. taking a moment. And actually, I hadn't, you know, and thinking, and also, and it, and it really it made me think, you know, because you'd sort of, it was about that sense of, you know, you can be anywhere in 24 hours in the globe yeah. now. Mm -hmm. But then, but then actually, then you get there and you're still in your own world. So maybe mentally you haven't changed the culture that you're going into. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. that can manifest itself in wearing inappropriate clothing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. in certain, you know, in certain countries and things like that, and you just think, and I used, and it sort of got me thinking. I can remember thinking, well, you know, it's probably quite a good idea when you used to have to go on a ship for sort of, you know, like a month or something. Mm -hmm. So it actually gave you time to adapt <laughs> to sort of what you're doing because mm -hmm. everything is so fast and so immediate yeah. now as well mm -hmm. and there isn't that time for reflection is there mm -hmm. and I think that's a big problem for business there's yeah. another uh, another Douglas Copeland line I think he says that um, jet lag is when uh, your soul hasn't quite caught up yeah. with you yet yeah. <laughs> it's taking a few days yeah. later yeah. to arrive with you in Bangkok but it's a bit like yeah. that I mean so, like if, so the, the difference say for example like to drive to the south of France is really different, like well, for me, than like flying mm -hmm. there because if you do, you see how the landscape sort of changes yeah. over sort of time. So when you kind of get there, you feel like you've kind of arrived because you, you've yeah. seen it, you've witnessed yeah. it, you've experienced it, rather than just finding there and finding there. And, and I remember like a little thing, like I suppose goes back to this technology thing. Is like I remember watching like Star Wars in the 70s and you used to kind of get these phones and you used to kind of like you used to see the Starship Enterprise above you. <laughs> and, 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 and it just seemed the most amazing thing. Not only could you have a mobile, mobile which like all phones obviously were all kind of plugged in there, but the fact that it was mobile, yeah. you could walk around, plus see someone's face, and you sort of think that would never happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it kind of happens. And, it, yeah. and the weird thing is how blase we become about it's it. Oh, yeah. All oh, right, okay, of course it can happen. And if someone invented like a, you know, a, a device where we, got, we all could fly and it was less than 500 pounds in the next couple of years, mm -hmm. at first, oh, fantastic. But I think we would take on that information and that ability to do it. So. Or that Quickly. you can press a button on your mm -hmm. phone and a car can arrive to pick you up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that can go from like being unthinkable yeah. to getting into a stranger's car like oh, yeah. that to mm -hmm. like now I find myself sighing when it's like more than four minutes away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just mental. <laughs> that yeah. happens very quickly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and you can be like the other side of the world and you can actually then speak on FaceTime mm -hmm. like to, my, to my wife, you know. Like this, where's maintain that, and maintain that connection. Well, whereas before in Australia, you were on the other side of the world. It, yeah. was, you know, it was 12 mm -hmm. hours behind you. You just felt you were completely disconnected. Whereas kind of now you feel like, well, you're there mm -hmm. and you're not there. And mm -hmm. it is that weird thing. It's kind of liberating, but kind of it's connecting, but disconnecting at mm -hmm. the same time. And those like intangible dialogues, when you were talking earlier, Hannah, about trying to archive emails, you know, it yeah. seemed like quite a quixotic mm -hmm. project. Yes. <laughs> But how, what, you know, what this actually means for mm. correspondence, that we're now mm. probably in what the final generation where we will have, let's say, writers who you'll be able to write a biography of based on their correspondence. You know, but, I mean, it's yeah. kind of, mm. that's, that's kind it. of mm. done now. Yeah. And what will that mean for things like archives of, you know, anything from how exhibitions were put together to anything yeah. else? Because these things actually will just be... And a lot of it is about understanding the motives for why people did things. I think that's what we're going back to what you were saying at the beginning about we're interested in other human beings. Mm -hmm. There is that materiality as well, but we're sort of interested in the impulses mm -hmm. of why people mm -hmm. did things in a certain mm -hmm. way. What was the thinking behind it? A lot of it is incredibly boring, as you mm -hmm. say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as well. But it's, it was interesting with when I worked for the Devonshires as well that the current generation is the first that is not writing a lot of letters. Mm -hmm. um, and that his... Uh, that his parents' generation, they weren't writing a, I can remember the dowager when I worked for her, but she was a duchess and she was saying, well, I, I write my letters, I write a lot of letters. So that, for her, that took the place of a diary so that mm -hmm. people, if anybody was interested in future years, come, she'd left something behind. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's gone on a step again where it's more, where it's emails that are composed by, you know, by private secretaries mm -hmm. that are then sort of going off yeah. as well whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. once upon a time you would have you know somebody's journal yeah and it was, it's all sort of gradually 
or sort even of emails uh, uh, composed by algorithm. Now. I mean, this kind mm. of, I think, still quite newish thing on Gmail, I've noticed on the app, that if you, when you're replying to an email, it will give you three or four pre-written options. Oh, God, I so haven't seen it, that yet. Yeah. So it's kind of, I think it arrived on my phone a few months ago. Right. And it's always right, you know, it's yeah. like, it will say, yeah, good idea, go ahead, or, yeah. or just like, let's talk next week, or, or whatever. Yeah. So actually, it's not only maybe written by a private secretary, it's like written by an <laughs> yeah. algorithm yeah. somehow, yeah. which completely depersonalizes well, the sense that. of yeah. correspondence. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, it'll be, maybe it'll be artificial intelligence that actually collates our archives. That they actually form, and you know, that it's artificial intelligence that somehow creates an archive on humans. Well, yeah, this yeah. is it. I mean, Maybe. It's, as well. That's it. Where does it? Yeah, where does, where does it leave all of us? I mean, there's yeah. this kind of the question in terms of automation. Where does it leave irony and sarcasm and mm. you know, all the good things? Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, but I mean, he's, you know, but but actually, will they not learn that yeah. as as well? Yeah. I suppose you know, and yeah. sort of, you mentioned yeah. Blade Runner. And that moment where the character is Ra Rachel, Rachel yeah. mm -hmm. and she realizes that she is, you know, she's not human, that her memories yeah. have been implanted, mm -hmm. that she's the memory of her mother, I think it yeah, was, or right. something that wasn't, that's not, that wasn't real. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, extremely. I think <laughs> <laughs> that on that, on that kind of moment of fake memories from the future or the past, <laughs> I don't know which. Um, and the idea of, I was just looking back over my notes, the idea of uh, a collection, a lace archive as a collection of holes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's something quite, um, quite striking about yeah. these absences, yeah. Um, yes. but also sensations that we've been trying to kind of talk around. Mm -hmm. But unless anybody has final remarks, uh, I, I think it might be a kind of interesting moment to kind oh, of close. Yeah. Like it's one o'clock. One o'clock already. Oh. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, re it's yeah, been it's remarkably interesting. Oh. To okay, I thank really you, Laura. Goodbye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> 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 um,